Hey, welcome to Can We Play Already? Uh, today we're doing a DM roundtable discussion on hard mode D&D campaigns. How to make them, why they're fun, why they're worth doing, all that kind of good stuff. Um, I've got some awesome fellow DMs here. I'm joined by Patrick and Steve, uh, and we're going to be introducing ourselves and talking a little bit about what our experiences is with uh, D&D, with being game masters, with making campaigns, with killing players, whatever you want. <laughs> Just all, all, anything that involves murder. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Let's let's In talk. Game. Let's talk about hurting our players. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I um, want their feelings to just be totally disregarded. Steve, we'll start with you. What's your history with D and D? Uh, so my name is Steve. Uh, I've been a dungeon master, at GM for about fifteen years uh, now. Kind of started in high school and just kind of always was the DM. Uh, I've played in a lot of campaigns as well. Um, as far as hard mode goes, uh, I actually don't like it very much. Uh, I have a lot of negative experiences and stories, uh, but that doesn't mean that on paper I don't like this the thing we're going to talk about. <laughs> I think there's a lot of good qualities in it. Uh, I'm excited to talk about those good qualities and talk about how you can really kind of bump those up while keeping those negative things kind of like to a minimum. I like that, how we can fix your negative experiences you've had with other people probably yeah everything we're going to talk about is like we're going to jump in a time machine and fix all my bad experiences and then love it great do we have one of those on set ben do we have one of those on set ben, ben could you get us a time machine please yeah it's not on the budget <laughs> oh, oh damn man. it good well if you like comment and subscribe maybe on our patreon but no <laughs> <laughs> patrick what's your experience with this game so uh as Julian said, my name is Patrick. I have been playing Dungeons and Dragons now for probably like four or five years. And I started off as a dungeon master, um, basically got my friends together, really wanted to play. And I've always been interested in storytelling and always had kind of an overactive imagination. So it kind of went from there. Uh, in terms of hard mode, I've never done anything that I would categorize as such. I've definitely had encounters and situations that I would think are quite difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I like I like to have a challenge, um, but I've never actually taken some of the rules that are in the Dungeon Master's Guide and actually applied them to a game. Um, reading some of them, I think a lot of them are really interesting, and I'm very excited to see how it works out, especially when you start DMing. Yeah, of course. Yeah, but uh, no, I, so I don't have much experience, but I'm, I'm eager to learn and talk about it. <laughs> 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 and what, what about you? Oh, what, what's your name? Um, I'm Julian. I am, uh, I'm similar to you. I became a dungeon master at a necessity because no one else was and I wanted to play Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I've been working with Dungeons and Dragons for uh, like five to seven years. Um, I've run a lot of different games uh, and different game systems. I'm a huge RPG fan. Mm -hmm. I hope to design my, I'm working on designing my own RPGs at the moment. Um, I love campaign crafting. I've done a lot of homebrew campaigns. I usually do a homebrew campaign. Um, and yeah, I, uh, I'm super excited to do another one coming up on this uh, this network. I'm going to be doing a Wednesday game starting next week at 7 p.m. I hope, and uh, it's specifically my players wanted to have a hard mode campaign. So I've been designing around that, and it is not something I usually do. I'm very nice to all my players all the time. I get so afraid they're going to die, but I want to push myself out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. um, what else? Where they're, they're yeah. basically they're masochists, and yeah. they're just like, please, daddy, like punish me. I guess so. Something along those lines. I've written a few uh, adventures too for the DMs Guild, and I think this will like kind of running like harder adventures will help me. Like I write very story focused adventures, so yeah. I think this will help me in my adventure writing too, and give me a little bit of more like what players can handle and like as a challenge, and why challenge can be fun, mm -hmm. how to do it appropriately, all that kind of stuff. Great. Yeah. Well, I wanted to like kind of jump into. I mean, I talked about it a little bit, but why hard mode is appealing at all, um, especially touching base on like video games, board games. We've all like seen the rise of popularity of like Dark Souls, Darkest Dungeon was huge on PC, Spelunky. There's a lot of like extremely hard board games that are really challenging that everybody kind of likes. Uh, I don't know. There's definitely an appeal, and there's been a lot of a lot of franchises that have, have, have succeeded off of that appeal. So mm -hmm. I don't know. What are your favorite experience with this? Have you played any really hard games that you actually liked, or did you hate them, or? Uh, I mean, I've the 
like lately the hardest game i've played is uh bloodborne like i never picked it up when it first came out i heard it's rough i mean i <laughs> never played a dark souls game before that i've mm -hmm. been i don't know why because it's right up my alley like i think it looks really cool and would be a lot of fun to do but just never done so but then there was a sale for bloodborne i was like i'm gonna pick it up a friend of mine record recommended it to me and it's a lot of fun but oh my god it's punishing and i hear sekiro which is uh the newest game by the same developers uh is even like more so uh haven't tried that one yet i've been meaning to check but, it out as well yeah yeah it looks rough it looks rough but yeah, but I like I like a challenge, but I'm definitely also I'm kind of similar to you that I'm very story driven. So I play a lot of like Japanese RPGs yeah. and like, you know, she's one of those. Yeah. So. <laughs> 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 like I like a challenge, but I also like I also want to get through it and like have fun. <laughs> but yeah, but a challenge is important because, you know, then it makes you feel accomplished. Like when I beat that boss in Bloodborne, I'm just like, yes, I'm the best. It's I, so I good. I totally agree. I played a bit of Dark Souls 3 because I watched my uh, my partner play through all the Dark Souls games recently. And I like the first boss at the game. That game is super hard. And it took me like two hours to beat them. And I, I felt fantastic never finish that game it is so difficult and I'm i haven't such, finished it either so bad at video games i'm so terrible at them if it's anything but a farming sim i'm like i'm out and, and even then it's just hard. like all my crops are dead <laughs> 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 what about you steve what have you so uh i love games like Mega Man. i love games like Ooh. celeste mm. i love darkest dungeon and I hate Dark Souls and I hate Bloodborne. Yeah, no, that's fair. They're different and games. They're, they're different games, but every time I talk to someone about they they say like, oh, if you love kind of like the the building to mastery of a level and like learning the system and like learning to really, you know, exploit the positives that your character has and like minimize the minimums and mm -hmm. things like that, Dark Souls is like right up your alley. And I just I just hate it. I, I hate playing it. It's a bad experience for me, but I love games like Mega Man and Celeste where I'll just die over and over and I'll just continuously fail until I finally get it. And it's, it's for everything I can gather, it's the same kind of like good positive feeling mm -hmm. that you get from these other games. Um, and it, it's a really interesting kind of, um, kind of dynamic there mm -hmm. where I don't like those games, but I like these ones. Uh, I have theories as to why that is, but you mentioned something about kind of like loving the story driven aspect of like the, not hard mode games. I'm trying to think of like a good term for those other games that doesn't sound like I'm downplaying them because they're great. Yeah, like, like I don't narrative want to, games, not, not I a, guess. You don't want to say like a game for filthy casuals. Yeah, you know, you're not, say, you don't want to say that. I was going to say soft core game, but <laughs> we're not going to, we're not, I'm going to avoid that one. I kind of like that term for it, but <laughs> I don't hate it either. Know, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but Darkest Dungeon is really interesting for me because I think a lot of people would agree that it's like a hard mode game where you have permanent death, a lot of people are going through the meat grinder. Uh, people are, are suffering through the game. But I find that game to be one of the most compelling narratives. And it was so compelling that I actually stopped playing the game at the very, I would, I would call last act. And I accepted that I failed in the game. I've lost. There is no redemption. And everyone is just, you know, going to be consumed by darkness. Yeah. And that's a, that's a, that's a tough thing theme to have but it fits great in like a hard mode type campaign so there's a lot to kind of explore today and I'm, I'm very very excited yeah i mean if you haven't played a lot of darkest dungeon there is that like beautiful narrative where you kind of conscript these faceless heroes um and you decide how you take care of them and i mean if you exploit them and drive them to madness and get rid of them the only free resource in the game really is new recruits so like you can churn through them really easily but there's kind of a moral dilemma in it it's like how do you play the game do you try and care and foster like a core party that you actually try and protect from this madness and like give rest to or do you just grind through a hundred different characters and then reach the end on this pile of corpses and you're like what have i done that narrative is totally like there and like if the game was not difficult that narrative wouldn't exist mm -hmm. yes. yes exactly well i really like that kind of crap that's wonderful yeah. very cool um as like a player like have you ever um from a player's perspective for sure for DD, &D, do you like what do you think the appeal is for a hard mode because like i had these players come to me and i thought when i posted i was like i really want to run like a really like open world kind of like hard mode edgy campaign where people die a lot maybe or like the challenge is really high 
I had a lot of people be like, oh my God, I can't wait to be in this game. Mm -hmm. And I thought I would get no response. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So what do you guys think the appeal is for players and stuff for this kind of thing? If you have any. I, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be somewhat negative here. So I apologize yeah. in advance. I like but this. <laughs> I think hard mode is not well defined for a lot of players. And I think if you ask 10 different people what hard mode means, you're gonna get 11 different answers. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think it's really, I, I think on, in general, if you were to ask, you know, who wants to play this hard mode thing? You're gonna get tons of responses, but I think it's a matter, and this is just the reality of right now, we need to really settle on expectations. So when someone says hard mode, do they really say that they wanna chew through characters and kind of have the experience of multiple characters, always kind of collecting what I'm gonna call like meta knowledge as we go on? That's more like a roguelike type situation. Yeah, Tomb Which, of Annihilation was designed that way as like a meat grinder kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, and um, uh, the old, old modules like mm -hmm. um, Tome of Horrors. Yeah, where, absolutely. Where you're like designed to like chew through characters so that as the player, you kind of like have this information so you can keep kind of succeeding and like you have small incremental successes. Hmm. Or it's kind of like reading a book almost where like game, like reading the you know, a song of ice and fire where so many of these characters you love, you follow and then they die. But because you, the, you know, the reader yeah. are still following along with the story, you're still able to follow it. Mm -hmm. So kind of like that. Exactly like that. Mm -hmm. And then you have other players too, who I think are in it for kind of the idea that if their character suffers a lot, then they're going to experience like the best moments of happiness and positivity. Mm. So, you know, they're looking for kind of like the really low lows and the really high highs. Um, but that doesn't always jive with the first kind of, you know, experience that I was talking about. And that's why I think it's really important to talk to, you know, your potential players and say, when you think hard mode, you know, what are you really thinking about? What kind of experiences are you looking for? What kind of stories are you looking for? Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Cause I think even yeah. mechanically, when you look at it, there's hard mode in, um, is your DM using rules for, say, tracking how much you carry? Are they using rules for food and yeah. water, which are all like in the core rule book, but they're not really well used. There are a lot of GMs hand wave that stuff. Um, yeah. Is your GM just going to be giving you really hard combat encounters? Is it kind of like uh, arena mode where you can see how many monsters you can beat until you just die and that's the ultimate goal? Or is it something that's actually reasonable for you to conquer just harder than normal? Um, I think all these things are different. Like, totally. yeah. Yeah, because that's what I was saying earlier when, you know, you asked about my experience uh, DMing with hard mode. You know, some people might see some of the encounters I make like normally for my players and they'd be like, yo, you are ruthless. And I'm like, it's, it's, only, it's only fun if, you know, your players are challenged. And so I, you know, except for a few like little, you know, in between battles or whatever, I like to make them hard because you know i feel like it's more fulfilling it's more fun for them they have to think about what they're really doing um deaths are still kind of not that common with me i find like sometimes they happen but like you know someone has revivify or we had one in ravnica we did episode one. Oh my god yeah you failed medicine me. check i did not <laughs> Justin did. <laughs> and I came within one death saving throw because I critically failed the death save in one mm. of our games and yes. I had one save left. Well, that so that fight in particular, like as well, was really hard. The, the fight where you died is because you were, you guys were at a low level. Yep. You know, you hadn't rested. Level one's rough. Yeah, it, w it was rough. But for that one in particular, uh, you know, in our Ravnica stream, I designed it to be hard. Like I wanted you guys to suffer. I'm glad it was a good story moment. It was a really good story moment and you guys nailed it. It was so fun. And well, one of my favorite yeah. moments in that whole game was like, you know, getting like banishing that vampire into the lake to get eaten by that sea creature. Like yeah, it was great. that was a crazy encounter where three out of the four of our party members were unconscious and like that moment couldn't have happened with the drama without it being a difficult encounter. Exactly. And I think as a DM, you kind of have that power as well, like that creative power. It's like, you know, I could have, he could have succeeded and like would have flown away instead of like, yeah, you know, fell, fallen in. But you know, you, he had a critical failure. I was like, let's make this fun. Absolutely. And you know, but you're, you're able to kind of do that behind the screen, you, you know, you guys don't know that it was a critical failure, really. It was in this case, but you know, I could have lied and just been like, oh yeah, like it was a critical failure. He falls down, you know, 
Yeah. Sometimes lying to your players is fun. <laughs> and take, is it good? Take note. That's like a sign of a great DM where, you know, you are driving for narrative and not, you know, just mechanically, let's just do what the rules say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got to be able to bend them a little bit. That is your power. That is your right. <laughs> I, I found that I had an experience with like a campaign that I was running and uh, we were just getting, I mean, I, I, this gets into the nitty gritty a bit, but we had a lot of spellcasters and the rules are really designed around this like adventuring day of like six decent battles a day. And like, I don't run very battle focused campaigns. I run more story focused and like political campaigns usually. So we were having like one or two battles a day. So like I had like a ninth level or 10th level bard who was getting on like a wizard as well. who got all their spell slots, like almost every battle. So like, I was throwing encounters that by the encounter building rules in the DMG were like deadly encounters. They never no. faced anything lower than hard, but they never came close to dying in the final games. Like we went up to like level 11 or 12 and um, I was having a really hard time challenging them. So like, I think they were kind of also getting a little bored with like wanting to have something better and we just hadn't planned in advance how we would make this challenging. Yeah. And we were kind of like, it was a great learning experience, but. Um, yeah, and context matters. So what you just described is a really good example of that when like, you know, if this is like the hundredth battle that they've been through in this dungeon and they're low on resources, they're low on health, and you have like this hard enemy coming by as like the final boss, yeah, they're gonna suffer and that in of itself is enough. But yeah, what you described is like, they were always at full health, always had all their spell slots and everything else ready. And then you can throw an enemy at them, but they just blow everything on him. And, but what I like to do in that case is like, oh, he wasn't really the final boss, here he is. <laughs> It's not even his final form. Yeah, it's just well, like fuck with him. That's a great segue into like, I want to talk a bit about how, um, what you can learn as a DM from running harder campaigns. And like, because for me, this is outside of my comfort zone clearly, mm -hmm. and I'm looking to learn from this. And like, I think a big thing that we've kind of spun around here is that you can learn how to appropriately challenge your players, especially like on a dime kind of change. Like it's really, it teaches you, I think, hopefully, to adjust your play style as a DM, as a game master, to kind of let that challenge rise or lower to help with the pacing of your game. You know, are things too easy? You can throw in some extra stuff. Are things too hard? You can take things down a notch, lower HP, you know, fudge some rolls and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, like, it's hard to know when to do that at the right like places or how much or how little to do. Mm -hmm. And I think this hard mode campaign will really help me learn like what are my players limits? Not just like on paper, but if I like push them and challenge them, will they think of stuff that they wouldn't when the challenge was less? Absolutely. And that's something that's going to come with practice for you and for them, you know? Oh yeah. yeah. And some corpses. <laughs> well, that's just fun. But like the good kind of corpses, not bad corpses. Yeah, exactly. The happy corpses. Yeah. We the, the, the corpses, corpses were <laughs> where friendship was like what the we got. The corpses are the friends they we die with, along the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they die with a smile on their face. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I think obviously all three of us can learn a lot from that. Um, what have you learned from as a DM, Steve, uh, from your bad experiences with hard mode games? Ooh, yeah, I'd like to hear about that. For totally. Sure. And th this is going to go back to kind of what players really get out of out of hard modes. But what I'm going to start with is that. When it comes to GMing or DMing like a hard mode, I think the number one thing that the GMs will struggle with and get a lot of joy out of is being consistent all the time. For a player, if an encounter doesn't go the way that the player kind of expected, uh, because, you know, for whatever reason, like, oh, all of a sudden that goblin can now had this other ability, we've never seen it before, and there was no other tell that they could do that. Mm. All of a sudden you start kind of feeling like betrayed, almost like someone's out to get you, like the system isn't fair. It breaks trust. It totally does. Which is does. so important for DMing. Like yeah. that definitely, you have to, you have to kind of, um, there's, a, there's a rule in Apocalypse World and Dungeon World, they give you these kind of principles that the DM should always follow. Yeah. And one of them, or like moves you can make uh, for the players, it's a move, sorry, and it's, um, you can always, they always tell you to hint at future dangers. So like play up one of the bad guys, like awful abilities that they're gonna come into play or, or play up like a future threat that's looming just beyond this next room or this next scene. Like I think that telegraphing is so essential to build that trust. It can be really hard, but you need to, you need to yeah. warn them. Yeah, and video games have done it for such a long mm. time. 
And video games are great at being consistent because, surprise, they're done by a machine. It can only really be consistent within certain constraints. Mm -hmm. But I think great examples of that consistency is way things like um, like the aliens in XCOM. They all kind of behave more or less the same way. They all kind of have the same abilities. Uh, Darkest Dungeon is really great because all the monsters always have the same abilities. The game actually tells you what the abilities are tells you what their percentage of resisting certain status effects would be and the player just has all this information so it's like the game is is trying its best to set you up but also telling you that hey when you're screwed you're screwed and i'm not gonna like pull any punches it's not mm. a cheap shot though you see it coming absolutely yeah there's resident evil games too like some of the originals that have done really well with like setting up cameras where you'll you know, you'll see the broken window, then you'll see the corpse, and then you'll see the blood dripping from the ceiling at that camera mm -hmm. angle. And it's mm -hmm. setting you up that like something big is coming. They even use like kind of the, just the framing of the different shots because they had that locked camera with that crazy PS like shit level processor. Mm -hmm. So they had to like lock these camera angles all over the place. But they would use that like a film to like hint that something's coming and where it's coming from and mm -hmm. like, it was that horror buildup. That and that's good set dressing too for yeah. a DM. Like, you know, it's good to, you know, that's something that I sometimes like struggle with. I want to remember like, oh, every room you kind of want to give it like a feel and an atmosphere. And, uh, you know, but it's a really good idea to say something like, oh, the, there's glass everywhere. It's broken. There's yeah. blood on like, you know, it sounds cool. And the characters like the players feel that too. Yeah. If you have hungry monsters, have some bones lying around in their rooms, right? Absolutely. Like have some hints that there's, you know, if they go into a cave and I want to hint that there's a creature that lives in this cave usually, I'll be like, oh, it's empty, but there's like... Fresh some... feces full of bones. <laughs> Fresh bone Fresh feces. feces. Fresh bone feces. My... Great. <laughs> a lot of uh, marrow. Um, <laughs> Just suck dry. <laughs> I love the idea of kind of like telegraphing to your players like something big is going to happen. Moves have done it since like the 1930s of like setting up and then paying off. And for me, the moment that it finally made sense was actually in Starship Troopers, the first one. And I love Starship Troopers. <laughs> so I call this effect, even though it's like, it has a name in film studies, I call it the brain sucker effect because there's a scene in Starship Troopers where they are, they're coming across an outpost. It's full of corpses and things like that. And then the commander is like, what does this corpse look like to you? And he has a giant hole in his head and his brains are sucked out. And they're like, I think his brains are missing. He's like, yeah, they were sucked out. And then later on, there's a brain sucker bug. And when it shows up, you're like, oh, like fantastic. Like what a great payoff. Um, it's like Chekhov's gun, right? Like you see, the, he knows. Well, I mean, if you want to be pretentious and like a film studies person. I yeah, do. I always want to be pretentious. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm thinking of. And I think um, when it comes to hard mode, I think telegraphing or setting up those Chekhov guns is really, really important. So your players kind of can ebb and flow along with your narrative because it's going to go through ups and downs like that. And if the players get hit with an up when they expect a down or other or vice versa, they're going to betray that trust and it's going to make the rest of the game start getting a little rockier and it's going to introduce risk. I love that. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> See, I, uh, I, and I totally agree, but there are definitely some cases <laughs> that I know of where I will, do something like that i will i will set up like oh look at oh look at these signs here oh what could it mean and then like they'll completely ignore it for something you know yep. like a red herring don't look at me when you say that <laughs> <laughs> i actually don't mean you i know i know but yeah i've, uh, I've had those players I've but had those yeah players. and then and then you know it'll come to the encounter and it'll be really hard and you know maybe someone almost died or whatever they're like like Jesus, what? Or like they'll be like frustrated. They're like, "Why isn't it working?" Blah blah blah. It should work. I was like, Ooh. "Yeah, there were some hands you could have asked." And it's just like it's like I'm not going to hold your hand, like you know. But that's the thing too. It's like um, some games like play with missables in ways that are, are really interesting. Um, like Gumshoe games are these detective games where um, there's this when you run mysteries. There's always this like. In D and D, especially, there's always a chance that players will fail too many rolls and not look in the right places, and they're going to miss key clues. So Gumshoe solves it by like guaranteeing they'll get the clues, but the the play is all to see how you get them and how much it costs you to get them. So it, it's kind of like ensures that they get the breadcrumbs. Yeah. Oh. I, I, I love the, now we're talking about mysteries, it's great. I know, uh, they're not all topics, but like, yeah. But mysteries are, are awesome, and I've 
in my experience, I, by the way, I, apparently I'm like the grandpa DM of this group, which is great. I'm, you are. <laughs> granddaddy. Oh. You're the eldest, yes. <laughs> um, I've screwed up mysteries all the time. Uh, it t- probably took me 10 years, probably, to get mysteries down to kind of like a repeatable process where my players could actually succeed. And it took a lot of weird kind of retrospective-ness for myself to just say like, wow, that mystery I set up, I couldn't have solved it. Like, there's no way I, as a player, could have solved it. So how could I yeah. expect strangers to do it? It's something I really think... I mean, it's not a mystery game, but I think it's something they mention mysteries in the DMG and yeah. they mention how to build them. But, like, I hate how they talk about these kind of... Like, they don't give you enough to go on. They, no. I think if you run by the book in D&D, like, you need to be homebrewing some of your own sit- or, uh, stuff or having your own system. Yeah, yeah. So what I have adopted now and what has set me up, set me up for success and also given me the opportunity to like play around and kind of play in that space is Justin Alexander, who's been writing about Dungeons and Dragons for um, years. Um, he has this three clue rule and similar to Gumshoe, he says, you know what? Just give your players three clues. Make sure they always get three clues and you've pretty much set them up for success. Yeah. Um, don't even give them a red herring when you first start off. Just see how they react to three clues if they blow through the mystery with just one clue, now you know that the next mystery you do, I'll throw in a red herring. So now that's maybe a little bit different and things like that. But these are all skills that I think really lead up to running a successful hard mode. Not that I don't think anyone should just kind of, like if you're a new DM and you wanna run hard mode, do it. I think it's great, it's fantastic. But I think in that particular setting, it's really, really important to kind of have these small experiments, kind of read a little bit and learn a little bit and kind of go into it knowing that there's gonna be learning on the GM's part um, to kind of make sure that the game runs, what I would say, smoothly. Okay, I like that a lot. You're liking a lot of stuff I say and it's like really boosting my ego. I like what both of you say, you're great people. (laughs) He's the host, he has to say it. No, 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 no. I I sincerely am happy with the uh, the (laughs) three of us uh, doing this today. It's actually, uh, Fairly wonderful. I think we have like a diverse experience with it too. So yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I think we're all great. I want to get a little bit into the design and like when I think about what I want to adjust in D and D for a hard mode campaign and what settings I'd want to homebrew. Mm-hmm. I like to start with like what is way too easy in D and D, and have you had experiences where things are too easy for either you as a player or for your players when you're the DM? Is there things they've rushed through? Are there things that you're like, I need to make this harder manually somehow because the rules is written or rules and practice are not doing me any favors. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I'm not actually sure now that I think about it. <laughs> it's weird. Like, I feel like a lot of where the difficulty comes from, comes from, for, like, for me personally, is what I make. Like, the, you know, the mysteries or the, or the encounters, mm-hmm. especially with, like, you know, who they're going to fight with. But when, in terms of, like, rules that I feel like, oh, this is way too easy, let me, like, let me tweak the rule a bit so it's, you know, harder. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever done that. I don't know. What about what about you? I've done a lot and I've failed at this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my, my experience with D&D starts with Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, I was like a small little bean and I didn't understand the rules. It was too complicated. Small little Steve. Yeah, and I, I just couldn't do it. I was like, hey, I want to be like a peasant hero. And then I didn't understand the rules, so I actually couldn't play. So we throw that one on the window. Oh. So it goes to 3.5, and 3.5 had a lot of good ideas to make the game kind of more lethal. But for this discussion, I think we should talk about 5e, because that's what I'm assuming you're playing. Yeah, that's what I'm going to be running. And coming from kind of that background, 5e, I think, is very forgiving uh, for first-level players. Uh, I think there's a lot of swings, and someone could like get unconscious very easily. But I actually think 5e is the most forgiving of all the additions for death. Mm. So when it comes to mechanics, there's a couple of things that I'd like to introduce to say that, you know, this is gonna be a more lethal game. One of them is death saves, and I modify that. I actually think it's too easy to just not die when you hit zero hit points. So what I've tried in a couple campaigns with some degree of success, which means of course that <laughs> I kind of fucked it up in other campaigns. <laughs> Can I swear in this, Ben? We already I'm have. Go- I've already done it. Um, I, every time you take a death save and you get a death save failure, so it ticks off of your sheet, that's a level of exhaustion. Ooh, So when you come up, you're not the same. So yeah, you can be saved, but you're going to come up and you can't really join the fight in a meaningful way. It's probably best if you want to live 
to kind of hide and wait it out. Unless, of course, everyone else is dying around you and you want that narrative of kind of, you know, Rocky gets up, his eye is cut open, he can't really see really well, but he's going to keep fighting because everything's on the line here. And if you want to tell that story, you know, introducing that mechanic gives that player the opportunity to really play mechanic. Uh, now I get to be pretentious. Um, <laughs> play into like the Ludo narrative of that, where they really want to tell the story of struggle. And the game has introduced a mechanic where they will struggle. It's way harder to fight when you have a level of exhaustion. Mm. Yeah, because first level is uh, half speed. No, it's ability checks. It's, it's all... Disadvantage on all ability checks, right? And all attacks. Second level is half speed. Mm -hmm. And then it goes up from there. Yeah. Um, I'm running something similar where I'm going to be... I'm using um, this uh, set of rules called uh, Darker Dungeons. And it's mm -hmm. a play on words from Darker, Darkest Dungeon. Yeah. Um, and one of them... I'm taking like and picking from what I do with it. Uh, it's a free homebrew thing you can find online on Reddit and stuff. But um, their death save throws I really like. They're... Uh, there's no successes, so you keep rolling. A 20 stabilizes you. Um, as before, a nine or less is a, is a check. And you uh, keep your checks, and on long rest, you can get rid of one. Yep. So if you get like two death save fails, you, next long rest, you're still gonna be at one. And until that long mm. rest, you're gonna be at two if you go down again. So um, it's a little more like, you know, these brief encounters with death, they don't disappear so quickly. It kind of like is a pseudo lasting wounds kind of thing. Yeah. So I'm excited to see how they fare with those. Um, and then it, uh, it's funny, it's like these rule sets kind of give and take, but to make it more interesting, they offer each character one fate point that is like a cheat death once in your character's life. They can like, so it's like kind of like one extra life. I don't know if I'm going to be giving out too many mm -hmm. of those for sure. But like, yeah, the death saves are something you can definitely affect because it's, I mean, you finish that battle, you're at zero death saves again or death fails. And it's just like, you can go down five times a day. It doesn't matter if you keep rolling well. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really interesting mechanic. Um, there's one thing that I've always been kind of interested in maybe trying and I never have. And so we're talking about it like rests, so long rest. I think it's kind of silly that after a long rest, suddenly you're healed, you're fine. It's just like, what? When can I never feel great after a nap? Like, you know, I always feel worse. Uh, so I would love, like, there's an alternative rule in the Dungeon Master's uh, Guide, and it does talk about, you know, how healing can be a lot more difficult. And I've always kind of thought that that would be kind of interesting to try. I, but I also know that it would be really hard. I, I like think it's it's fair though. Like, like I said, I had that example of where they we didn't have eight combats a day or six combats a day, so their long rests at like tenth level are just giving you like twenty spell slots, and it's ridiculous. I think the best. I think the, the easiest thing about D&D is the rest system for 5th edition. It is super forgiving. Because yeah. um, you can literally just do a battle, go outside the dungeon and camp, and then do a battle the next day, go outside and camp. I think the best rule you can possibly change is to make your long rest take a week. And to make a, a requirement that they're in a safe place, yeah. like a town or a village. And that's one of the recommended things, So right? that's one thing I'm running with, is long rests are a week, and you have to do them in a, in a sheltered place. So like I you can't take them in a dungeon it. in the wilderness. So it's going to make the spellcasters at level, like, I think we're starting at level three. But that's still only, like, what, four spell slots, five spell slots? Depending, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's, like, pretty, like, they're going to have to really pick and choose their spells. Which I think, like, really balances spell casting and martial. Like, also way too easy in D&D. &D. Just play a spellcaster. I yeah. mean, compared to like a fighter, you're gonna be finding it very easy to do a lot more AOE damage, to take down a lot more mobs very quickly, to survive a lot more challenges with your utility spells. Like, yeah. I, I like the variant rule, which is in the DMG. It's under Gritty Realism, um, like page 270. I'm just gonna throw out there. Sure. But, <laughs> damn. <Yeah. laughs> I did, I did my homework. Yeah. Um, but I I honestly think, this is my honest criticism of Wizards of the Coast and their team, that it was slapped in with kind of not too much foresight, and I don't think they play tested it. And the reason I say that is because it really bumps up the, the efficacy of martial fighters, like fighters, monks, uh, even warlocks, basically classes that rely on short rests. 
and really, really hurts classes that rely on long rests, which are Your sorcerers and barbarians. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They actually are pretty reliant oh, on long rests. So, right. Yeah, so, like, the fighter can keep fighting kind of, like, throughout the days, but at some point, the barbarian's going to get so exhausted, they need a week to get their rages back. And that, I don't think they really play tested out when they wrote that rule in. So this is kind of where um, I think it, it's important to talk to your players and kind of mm -hmm. talk about what makes the most sense for, um, you know, the, the gritty realism that makes sense for the, the table. Maybe the barbarian actually does get rages back on a short rest. Maybe that's what yeah, feels good. Yeah, you can homebrew rules to kind of adjust that stuff. If, if you're changing the mm -hmm. level of rest or if you want to play with that mm -hmm. and you feel like someone's really like, or like, you know, giving them something like um, wizards have their arcane recovery where yeah. they can recover a few spell slots on a short rest. Maybe improving that for wizards and offering to other spell casting classes as well. If you're extending rest time, that could be a nice save too. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, it can be, you know, and it says a week, it can be less than a week. You can adjust yeah. that too. And it can be a week for healing, you know, physical wounds like your hit points. But, you know, you can have a long rest for spell casting be like, you know, maybe three days instead of yep. seven. You, you can know. make the long rest 24 hours, you know, like there's mm -hmm. a lot of. So there's a lot of options there. Um, I think too, like people don't play with rewards enough in D and D. So when you're like trying to like work around these things, we got so such on a tangent, but I really like it. <laughs> um, but you can give alternative rewards. Like it's fine if your reward is like a magical surge of energy that gives the casters a few spell slots. Yeah, like that's a really good unique reward that helps out your players or giving hit dice because those are really crucial when your long rest is a week. Having three mm -hmm. hit dice is like it's gonna really knock them on the floor, which I'm excited for. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, about a week ago, someone had linked me like some someone's blog post on basic, basic red RPG. I probably got that name wrong. But they redesigned all of the hit point systems and HP now stood for hope points. And Ooh, I'm already interested. <laughs> yeah, so, so this homebrew system was that your hit points, like if you got hit, it reduced your hope of seeing the end. Um, so like every single like wound you got reduced your hope. Whenever you saw someone get hurt, like a friend, it reduced your hope. Oh. Whenever you saw something that like told you that, you know what, what you're doing is right, it increased your hope. So for some, so for some characters, seeing religious iconography, that was like a, uh, like a beacon of hope and it increased their HP and things like that. Very similar to like madness rules and stuff that a lot of games try and invoke. Absolutely, and I, I think I saw a lot of kind of that inspiration, but I liked it was not madness you accumulated and weighed you down, but hope that kept you going. And I think that played a narrative that's mechanically more or less the same, but the, but the narrative is way, way different. Mm -hmm. um, so we were talking about kind of, you know, getting hurt and long rest and things like that. So I could definitely see, or in boons, I could see the DM saying, you know what, you know, you come across a crypt and inside you see two skeletons uh, and they're embracing each other. It was definitely two people who died who said, we're gonna die together. And for some of the characters, that might be a couple more hit points that maybe you as the DM have designed to say, let's give them a little bit more because the next encounter that's coming up is actually quite difficult. So, by changing the frame of that and kind of working with your players as to what the narrative you want to to say is here, that might give you some interesting and novel opportunities. I like that. That's good advice. I'm gonna jump in now. Uh, so we have a viewer uh, on it. We have several viewers actually, so that's I mean, yeah. uh, really Thank nice. Thank you. Uh, Shazdar is asking though, um, uh, Steve, you mentioned someone named Justin uh, Alexander. Justin Alexander. Okay, there we go. Thank you for that. I missed it, so I wasn't able to answer that in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, um, Shazdar is commenting, uh, Julian, uh, trying to recreate the five-minute workday. Uh, if you have full <laughs> abilities to play, uh, that's what MMOs are for. So... <laughs> Any uh, any thoughts for for that comment? It's our first uh, kind of question comment of the day. I am not sure I fully understand what their what their meaning is, of like uh, being on the clock or 
taken the, the extra time kind of thing? Is that what it is? I'm actually not positive either. Or is he saying like, oh, because in MMOs, like the there's like so, the cooldowns and so then you're fine. I, I'm gonna jump into this because I love MMOs. Yeah, I'm me too. Big, big WoW translate? player. I love Final oh. Fantasy 14. Okay, good. I was like, um, oh wow. But MMOs, I think, have a lot to talk about us, but hard modes because they literally have hard modes built into them. Yeah, mm -hmm. the rating and stuff like that is absolutely. And then you have the hard mode raids, which one the party has to opt into, which means you as the system actually ask the players, do you do you want to play that way? Mm -hmm. And they say yes, enthusiastically so. So you have that like trust already built. So when they die, maybe, they're okay with it. They're like, we, we signed up for that. So I, I like that a lot. From an MMO perspective, hard modes I like a lot because they really, really exploit that part of hard mode is resource management. And I think at its core, a hard mode almost always has to have very strict resource management. If you look at Resident Evil 2, the one, yeah, that's the one with Jill. And mm -hmm. That one's an intense resource management. You're oh, always going to yeah. run out of bullets. Like, you're never going to have enough bullets. If you look at WoW and Final Fantasy XIV, by the time hard mode kicks in and, like, you're getting thrown all these AoEs that you need to avoid and there's fire everywhere and people are dying... You know, your healers will run out of mana at some point and they need to they might need to make the decision. Do I save person A or do I save person B? Mm -hmm. And I can only save one of them. And if you want your players to, to really like experience that trolley dilemma within the game, you have to force them to really use their resources. And sometimes and you have to make sure that there's never enough resources. There's also um for rating like in Final Fantasy 14, you know, there's there's like a meta of, you know, this is the best like party that you want for yeah. like hardcore rating, right? These kind of things get solved, you know. Exactly. I mean, Final Fantasy 14 is still like pretty well balanced when it comes to that, to my understanding, that like even if you're outside the meta, you can still raid and like mm -hmm. have fun and be useful. But there is a meta like this is what the best is currently. And you know, and, and because then you can actually try and balance that sort of thing of like resource management. Well, if you have a bard, they can use refresh and then suddenly, you know, you have your your MP is being regenerated. Right. Uh, you have maybe you have a summoner and summoners, their DPS, but they can they can res. Right. And uh, so there are things like that that, you know, and maybe that's something that could be you know, a lesson for you. Like, do you maybe want to get all of your players together and they make their characters together because maybe they want to make sure they're really balanced or maybe that's something you want to avoid maybe you're like no let's let's i think like yeah mess them up <laughs> when you're saying it's an opt-in experience i think that's like getting your players enthusiastic support for having a hard game is good too yeah. ben you think you have something to chime in with uh yeah i'll i'll chime back in here so uh shazar uh replied to, to clarify that uh the five minute workday is uh when you use up all your abilities and burn out and then have to rest again to regain them before you can kind of continue oh, all right when you first turn fireball and you know yeah yeah okay yeah. And, like you so, just get everything out of the way so uh they're saying well an mmo is just a few seconds cooldown as like the alternative so that yeah. was the point uh there and uh, that D, D strives on the management of those missing abilities to uh continue the adventure so that's part of the tension there yeah uh, i like to amp up that tension mm -hmm. with the long rest rules uh but uh ergo was saying uh julian was saying just blow all your spell slots then long rest uh then do it again tomorrow so yeah. it takes about five minutes in game time to do a complete day of play so i guess the the idea there is uh well we had that encounter so uh can we just skip a week and like you know right so how do you make it how do you do it so that um and i think that's actually a really good point is because yeah. in game yeah it'll how, be a week. how about patrick you just you can rephrase the question to julian oh all right ready, so sure. julian. Re ready? <laughs> and uh action i'm ready <laughs> so julian um how are you going to make sure that you know a week of rest of a long rest in game is going to translate in real life because um you know, you can have a long rest and it's just a night and then whatever the next day they're all healed up and, you know, it takes only a few minutes or seconds even. 
Um, but if you want to do it so it's a week this time that they're resting in some sort of haven or a town or someplace that's safe, relatively safe, mm-hmm. um, how is that going to be translated in real life so that they feel that difference that's like, oh, we actually, it, it has been a week. I think like uh, downtime activities are really good for that. Um, there's something like I don't find enough, like without that rule, I find it's really rare characters want or players want to take a week or two off to do downtime activities. Mm. So like what my plan is, is um, first of all, like it prevents you from just encountering resting, encountering resting, because like, a week passing is time for all the villains to make their moves. A week passing is time for things to go from bad to worse. And also, if you're going out into the middle of the desert to go to this forgotten tomb, you need to go all the way back to town to rest. So you are probably going to run through like three or four encounters minimum before you get there and before you get back. So I think it's going to force them to plan out, okay, I'm going to have at least four encounters today. I better parcel these, res- or parcel these resources appropriately. But also, um, yeah, I want to do some downtime for them. I want to uh, give them a few rumors when they're in town resting too, and mm-hmm. kind of just like montage over it. I definitely want it to be a time where they can do stuff like train though, or if they want to look for rare items that they need for their quest, or if they want to you know, learn new abilities, uh, run a business, whatever the hell they get up to, you know players. Mm-hmm. I think downtime, downtime activities can be really fun. And um, I've been playing a lot of Blades in the Dark lately, and they do a really good job of like, every time you do a heist or a, or a score, you immediately follow it by downtime, and they give you options like in indulging your vices to lose stress or, you know, finding these items or, or meeting people at parties or spreading rumors. So like, I love that kind of crap. It goes really well. I think that's a really good idea. I also like uh, what I was kind of getting at and like you touched on it and I'm glad you did was uh, consequences for like, yeah. you know, for taking a week long because you're absolutely right. You know, you if it's just one day, then yeah, you'll probably still catch up to the villains and whatever. It's If it's a week, it's like you get to their base, they're gone like or something like that, yeah. right? I think it's very realistic too to be like battling and going you know, like facing monsters to need a week to recover from injuries. For sure, I think that's very reasonable. I would love to have a week break after getting crushed by like yeah. a zombie horde. Eight hours? You know? No, thank you. Um, there's a there's a game I play too called Thirteenth Age that's designed by some of the developers from fourth uh, from third and fourth edition, um, and they do something called the full heal up. So they don't count days; uh, they count battles. And if you do four good battles you get a full heal up. And the DM makes it up, maybe you found like a fountain of healing energy or maybe that's when you get back in town, you try and time it out. Three or four really good battles, you earn the right to do a long rest. But you don't until you do those battles. So when you're battling, you can kind of know how much is coming. And if you, the players have the option to take their long rest early, but they suffer a campaign loss. So they knowingly, if they take it after two battles, they know the DM is gonna make something really bad happen in the story. It's not a mechanical loss, it's a narrative campaign loss. Like if they're trying to recover this artifact before the villain does and they can't make it to four battles and they say we have to stop, that villain gets that artifact. Like they lose, they don't finish the quest. So it's not like in a lot of video games where it's like, you know, they're kind of just floating in the ether waiting for you to just come upon them, right? It's like timing is important. It also just makes you as a DM like, it's not simulationalist at all, which is what the long rest rules in D&D are. It's simulating actually the resting does this. It's saying, no, this is a mechanical thing. It's your job as a DM to work it in with the narrative, but like it does not reflect real life. This is a video game mechanic or like a, a purely removed mechanic, not based on human life or how we operate. It is just arbitrary and it's your job to make it work. Whereas D&D is like, oh, when you actually sleep, you recover hit points. It's a little bit of suspension of disbelief, but yeah. it's also in a world where dragons are of real course. and like... It works really well for them. Yeah, it, it does. Yeah. I think it's really important that when you introduce those mechanics of like, you know, the villain will win if you give up. I feel like that's an expectation to really set up front. For because sure. unfortunately, a lot of players might come in with maybe a preconceived notion that, oh, we can just rest and come back. And if they rest and come back and things have changed in a way they didn't expect, they're gonna feel betrayed whether or not, you know, we as this kind of meta audience feel that it's valid or not. Mm -hmm. It doesn't change the fact that that particular player might say, you know, I don't get it. Why isn't the villain here anymore? Or why is my artifact here anymore? Like we only rested for a week, it should still be here. 
And once you hit that point, and now you need to go backwards and say, well, the reason for that is because what you've done is you've disrupted the flow of the game. Uh, that player is already hurt. So now you're kind of like trying to make up lost ground. Damage Whereas control. If, damage, it's damage control. Whereas if we had set that expectation early on, now that player, the artifact's not there anymore. The player goes, crap, I should have known. Like we had talked about that. That's my bad. I've made a mistake. We can keep going from there. Exactly. Or they can say, I don't like that rule. That rule actually is like, I don't like this style of play. And I think we should talk about maybe changing it so that I can enjoy the game a bit more. Well, this leads really well into what I want to talk. I want to talk about, like, aside from design, how this plays at the table, what are things that you have to do as a DM to make sure hard mode games go over well with your players? What's your prep look like? What's your session zero look like? Yeah. What do you need to do to make sure hard mode is okay with your players and they're not going to feel cheated? Yeah, and I think Steve touched on it perfectly. Like, I'm actually gaining, like, I love whenever I'm talking <laughs> with you because you do have so much experience and I'm just like, oh my God, like, yes, give me I advice. love it because I just have like this, like, like, uh, like Greco-Roman, like, God like figure in my head where I'm like, come with me. We're going to play tabletop games. <laughs> I mean, that is how I picture you. What an adventure fan, we're on. In my fanfics about Steve, that's very much how I describe him. Yeah. yeah. If, you, if you subscribe to our Patreon, you'll get those fanfics. <laughs> or Patrick's only fans. <laughs> where I act them out. No. Uh... <laughs> gotta laugh from ben. ben yes <laughs> laugh from ben is my favorite i always feel good about a ben laugh um no but i think exactly what steve said is setting up those expectations right from the get-go and that's something that i have i've definitely tried to get better at as like i'm you know as i'm getting more experience as a dm because there are definitely sometimes i'd be like my players would be like well why why would you do this and i was like well how could how could they not be like that? Like kind of, you know, sometimes I'm sassy and but and that's fine. But I think it makes a lot more sense to be like, here is what you can expect from me as a DM. Here's what you can expect out of this game that we're going to play together. And then at least like when it does happen, if they do start to get a little salty, you can remind them like, well, I did say blah, 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 because you will still get some players who, you know, are going to be salty. There are some people who like playing the game because they like the game, they like the loot, they like being strong, you know, and then there are some players that they like the failure because that, you know, creates that tension, makes a more interesting narrative. But, you know, at least for those players who like, you know, maybe do get a little salty when things don't go their way, you can at least be like, well, you know, this is kind of what we agreed upon. And but I think you should also have the possibility for like, you know, maybe they thought, oh, I will enjoy this. And then it gets into it and they're like, you know what? I don't think it's very, I don't, I don't like this. And being, having that open dialogue that like, you can talk back to me, like, you know, you can challenge yeah. me on things. Um, you know, there are some times when my players will challenge me and I will be like, no, like absolutely not. And then there'll be times I'll be like, yeah, you're right. Or I'll think about it. And then other times I'm like, you're absolutely right. Like, That's why let's I always argue that. with you when you DM. And you know what? And first of all, and you don't really, you're, like, you're lovely uh, as a player, but, but you know, there have been times where I'm like, oh, well, what about, and I'm like, yeah, no, that makes yeah, sense. Creativity is awesome. I always try and reward it. And yeah, and I'm a per, and I'm human. We're human as, as much as DMs, we like to feel like we're gods. Well, we, we make mistakes and it's okay to bring that up and. You know, and especially you're going to be doing this and it's going to be kind of your first experience yeah. in hard mode. Like, just say, tell you that, say that to your players. Like, I'll, Well, we did a session zero in character creation and like mm -hmm. expectations, everything. So like the first thing I did before we made characters, I went through everything, every change I'm making. And some of them are pretty like, so like some of them deal directly with character creation. Um, I nixed uh, dark vision. If you have dark vision, you now have low light vision. If you have like superior dark vision, you get regular dark vision. But I like oh. backtracked it because darkness is not a threat in D and D because n like nine out of ten races have dark vision in this game, which makes like all that kind of having to have light or thinking about light pointless. So um, I nixed that. Uh, like we're doing inventory system where it's slot based. So you have like a number of slots equal to your strength. Well, equal to depending on your size and your strength mod a bit. 
Um, and like something that fits in your hand is like one slot, something a little bigger is two, and there's three slot items too. Mm -hmm. And um, that's been really interesting because even buying equipment, they're like, oh, I can't hold that much because I decided to wear heavy plate mail. So like I can't carry them. I'm like, that's realistic. Like if you're carrying around this plate mail, plate mail armor or wearing it, you're not gonna be able to carry everything. Um, so we did rules like that and it went over everything with them ahead and I'm like, is this okay? Do we want to adjust anything? Like if you're playing a spellcaster, be warned, the long rests are a week in this one. There's even like, I'm playing with magic burnout too. So they roll, they roll a die every time they cast spells and if they roll like a one, they have like a backfire. Like the spell still happens, but they might lose hit points or something. Like spells backfire, and the more they cast spells, the more likely it is to burn out. Ooh. So it's like mana almost. Like it's like you know your die gets smaller, and if you roll the low numbers, you're gonna you're gonna see it. So we had this great conversation. It was amazing. Um, everyone's really pumped. I did this a lot because I know session zero is so important. But before in this game that was getting really easy with these high level casters, I tried to be like, hey. This game's too easy now. It's a it's a joke. So one day I was like, I want to do some stuff and introduce some stuff, and they're like, Oh, cool. We'll talk about it next session. And I brought it up, and I'm like, I'd like to do an inventory system where we do slots instead of just like you carry everything. And I want to do like I think I tried to do the Thirteenth Age. You have to do four battles for a long rest now. Um, I just want to try to do stuff like that. And like my players went like crazy. They hated it. That game <laughs> ended in two more sessions. I swear I ruined I. I tanked a campaign. I tanked it hard. Because we set up and we played for like a year doing this easy mode and I'm like, I wanna do this and they sounded cool on paper but like I didn't set up the expectation from the beginning. The expectation I set up for that year was like, this is a walk in the park with a bunch of fun, funny friends that have fun. Mm -hmm. And like that was the vibe I did. And I felt like- some, Which is fine too. I think yeah. some players really liked it and some players wanted something grittier but mm -hmm. like, just trying to introduce it, it was like a this side versus that side. It became really... Yeah, player dynamic is important. And these same yeah. players are like into a hard mode campaign and are like, you know, people who like the idea that I've been talking to and like, oh, I would love to play a hard mode campaign if it's set up from day one. If it is like in, you know, if I know what it is, I think even just to like teaching the game really well, making sure players have a list of what they can do in combat, making sure players know the rules, like... I'm sure you've all played board games that are really hard where you lose the first game because you didn't know the rules mm -hmm. and you tried to plan for some end game condition and then they're like, oh, well, you actually can't do that. And you're like, well, that was my win, so I guess I'm done. Like, not knowing the rules is a huge barrier. I think, like, all this prep is so much more important for these hard mode games than it is for anything else. For sure. Yeah. I don't know. Since we're commiserating about campaigns that have yeah, failed, please, please. Uh, so I, I'm gonna be so again. Granddaddy DM here is saying uh, two months ago uh, I had a campaign almost fall through because I didn't set the proper expectation. Without meaning to do it, I introduced a lot of hard mode rules. That exhaustion rule was one of them, um, and I had I'm very very lucky. My players and I we have good feedback sessions. And I can talk about my structure of how we do feedback at the end of sessions. But literally two months ago, my player said to me, uh, one thing I wish we would change is that we could just be happy every once in a while. Uh, I feel like everyone is miserable all the time and everyone's suffering. Can we just have like good moments? I remember you talking about this before. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I was like, holy crap. And like it caused me to reflect. And I thought about it and I was like, oh my God, I've taken all the NPCs they love and I've hurt them all horrendously. The NPCs only ever talk about like, their their PTSD about their depression about how they're struggling and they don't get any of like the fun moments of like let's have like you know ramen at the shop and like someone like scratches someone's head and things like that and, and my players were like I want those moments and as a dungeon master I never talk to them and say like how many moments or things like that do you want and once they've told me that feedback then narratively I've I've written my NPCs like you know, some of them are going to make fun of like their traumas and what have you. They're going to try to make light of it because I feel like from my experience, some, <laughs> from my experience, a lot of humans will try to like make jokes. You mask it with the humor. You mask it with the humor. Okay, I'm feeling really attacked. <laughs> and, no, okay. Sorry, and, this is an intervention for Patrick. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, so uh, I've written in for my next session, my players, they're going to actually, you know, come across some of the NPCs who have been really downcast and what have you. And they're going to make jokes about it. For example, I have an NBC who recently came across uh, a disability. They had their arm cut off. And they've been very 
uh, they've had a lot of trauma with that psychologically because it's their dominant hand. Um, and in the next scene they're going to have with them, they're going to like put a hook on the hand and make jokes about it. Because in my mind, when it comes to trauma physically like that, sometimes you just make jokes about it and it helps. It's dark humor. It helps the pain. And yeah, I think, low's humor. Yeah. And I think my, I think my players will really resonate with it and they just want to see that, that person smile and laugh and that's going to be the tell that you know what they're healing a little bit and all the work they put into like this npc to like help them through their journey it is paying off in small increments and i think that's really what they were trying to say to me in their feedback and you're like i'm making a difference i'm making like or this person's life is improved or something like that absolutely mm -hmm. yeah so like I have, um, I'm working on a tabletop RPG myself that's about like, it's very focused on character arcs and character stories. Mm -hmm. And one of the rules I've actually been playtesting in it throughout the last year has gotten like a ton of positive feedback. And it's called Gather by the Fire. And it's after you accomplish something really challenging, you gather by the fire. And it's that scene around a campfire or in the ramen shop or wherever you are. And you all go around the table and take a moment to talk about what your character does to de-stress and what how the current story is affecting them and where they're at it might be playing a game of poker with a friend it might be you know gazing up at the stars for a while um it might be just being sullen sometimes but like it's a moment of calm and it helps it's, it's primarily a pacing tool to help like with the calm after the storm but yeah, it's a chance for the characters to have a little levity. It's like, it's a scene where like, they are told there is no threat. No one has to stand watch. Gather by the fire is like something you do. There's not like no monster. I, the GM, am restricted from hurting you. Yeah. So it gives that, sometimes it's like, I really say that in D&D too, just being like, no one has to watch tonight. You're safe. I guarantee you. I'll tell it to my players sometimes. I'll just be like, I promise you, I have nothing at my sleeve. I want to see some story. You don't get enough of that. I don't know. Yeah. Darkest Dungeon does that mm. because in the long dungeons, they, the game tells you there will be a long dungeon and you will have a long rest. The game tells you like when you take that long rest, there are certain abilities each class can do to bump each other up and have that moment by the fire. And yeah, there is a chance you get attacked in the night, but there's actually abilities to make sure that you're always safe. Ah, yeah, yeah. Like so that. you can you can actually, and I do this when I play the game, I always make sure I have someone in the party who can make sure that we're always safe during the campfire because narratively, I actually really like that, that narrative in my mind where, you know, my, my um, what do you call them? Uh, my leper, you know, takes off their mask and it stresses everyone else out, but it helps my leper feel like, more at ease and more on their own skin. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I like I like when my um, jester, I like when my jester pokes fun at someone and makes them super stressed out, but everyone else kind of like feels better at the expense of like one of their party members. And I'm like, that feels a lot like a experiences I've had in yeah, my life. Yeah, that's real. Yeah, that's, and it, it hits you really, really close to home. And you can really only have those experiences and like the the safety to tell those stories and share those experiences with your players uh, and your GM if you set those expectations and are willing to kind of play inside that narrative. Yep. Oh, I have something. I have something I'm going to be doing similar in my campaign story next week. It's uh, part of this darkest dungeon or darker dungeons rules. And it's uh, when you make camp at night. It's even if it's not a long rest. Um, it does give you a chance when you fully make camp to see how well you make it and see how protected it is. And then you can like, you can tell a story or something or play an instrument to have a chance to give someone else inspiration. So you can like, or you can cook a good meal if you have cooks utensils. It gives you some options of like, kind of like low key downtime of what you do before you sleep. And it allows you to award, like the players to kind of award inspiration to each other a little bit. Um, it's very neat. I also am now thinking, I'm like, is Alarm the best spell you can take to con for good stories and games? Because like, I never take it because I'm like, well, this feels like it's always something better to take than Alarm. But Alarm would be like the perfect thing to make sure that if your DM's not going to give you safe respite and when you sleep and stuff, you could create those moments by casting Alarm and then at least you feel a little safer so maybe the other players in your party will subconsciously open up more. <laughs> in my head, uh, whenever like anyone places the alarm spell i like i hear the alarm from uh the simpsons like uh 
Apu like presses the silent alarm and it's like silent alarm activated. Like, <laughs> I really like pretty that. much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this leads us to something. How do you, uh, everyone deals with this differently. And I think, uh, we've touched a little bit on it, but we've been dancing around it. Character death is really big. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of players put a lot of like hard work into making amazing characters and you get attached, especially if your campaign is going on a long time. Um, we talked about how you could prepare for it. I think like, Obviously, talking about how you want to approach character death in advance is really key. How do you guys handle character death? Have you had characters die? Have you had it go well? Have you had it go badly? Is there anything you do differently than the book says to make it better? I've only had characters die at like, <clears throat> similar to when you were playing in Ravnica, like at a very low level, and then you didn't really have the chance to kind of develop that connection with it. Uh, I haven't had the experience yet where anyone's died, like, I've had people die and then like, uh, they're like, oh, I have a scroll of Revivify. Oh, I'm, like, let me try and cast it. Oh, it was a success. Like, you know, I've had that and that was always fun. Uh, but I, I actually don't have any experience with it. So I, I honestly don't know how I would handle it. I had, uh, I had one campaign, I tried this out. It didn't work out, but it could work out for some tables. Uh, I removed I removed death saving throws. Mm -hmm. uh, I was like, when you hit zero hit points, you die. Whoa, Yay! rough, rough, rough. I hope they start at fifth level. Jeez. Yeah. So that was actually part of it, where I was like, because first through three levels are so what I call swingy, as far as <sighs> mechanics go, um, they couldn't start anything less than three. Uh, absolutely. I, I would. Yeah. That'd be. So, but like, again, it starts with expectations, where you're like, you're starting at level three, and also you don't get death saves. Just like any other monster, once you hit zero hit points, you're dead. That's it. There's like maybe you get some dying words, but I'm sorry, but you like your chapter has closed. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on kind of the narrative you want your players to 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 be part of, that might be really great, or it might be the the worst thing in the world. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Uh, there are other ways to make the game feel more deadly. If you want death to be more of like a prevalent theme, and not all groups want that, of course. But if your group really wants to tell the story about losing someone close maybe not close to you and watching them die you know we, we can talk about these these extra rules so one that i've used that 3.5 used that has now been adopted as a variant rule in dmg um, is massive damage um, where if you take a certain amount of damage if it's too big the shock of it might just kill you Oh, not just the regular where if you go negative hit points. Yeah. So right. the, the general rule is if you take damage equal to or greater than half your maximum hit points, that's qualified for, ma for massive damage. And in 3.5, you'd actually make a fortitude save uh, or a constitution save if that makes more sense or die. The shock just kills you. Wow. Um, which means that those, you know, squishy casters they're actually a lot more frail than you might think if a rock falls on them and they take a bunch of damage or like an umber hulk just like crushes them in their 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 grip yeah. they could just die from that it's to realistically kind of have death from shock be a thing absolutely if you take a look at the dmg in three in fifth edition uh there's actually a table to roll on yeah so it's like roll on this table one of the results is you just die from massive damage some of them are just permanent injuries and stuff though exactly yeah and i and i like the permanent injury thing as well uh, because i think it it also creates like kind of interesting you know change in narrative where because usually again you take a long rest and then you're fine but it's like how are you going to long rest that, you know, that arm that you're missing now? Like, mm -hmm. I am going to be using one of theirs where um, it's kind of like, well, it's it's alluded to in the DMG or I'm using a variant of it. But if they need to, if they're below half HP, half their max, they have to use a healing kit to heal in my game. Yeah. So they have to keep them and have uses of them, um, which I think I told them 18 times when we were in character creation. And I don't know if anyone bought one, but um, <laughs> Yeah, they have to have some kind of magic or, or healing kit to do that. Mm -hmm. um, as well as like if they drop to zero, there's a chance they might get some lasting injuries. Just yeah. like, or even just like temporary injuries that cause exhaustion. Like even just talking with you guys now, I'm thinking about like taking a few of the lighter of the hard rules and like maybe asking my players how they would feel about yeah. introducing. Because 
I do think it's exciting. <laughs> like, well, that's the thing. There's no excitement if there isn't risk. Um, exactly. And like, you know, it's the reason inventory tracking is so boring. Because if it isn't... Con- so boring. If it isn't difficult, there's no fun to it. So like using a, a slot system is generally a lot... Uh, a easier to like manage because it's a lot simpler math but b it's like it adds a restriction so then interesting like inventory is interesting Mm -hmm. to me as a player if i'm limited with inventory and i have to really think about how many torches and how many like med kits and how many like what am i carrying three types of clothing now or am i just carrying one you know like Mm -hmm. it's all this kind of stuff is actually a kind of interesting thing um yeah i i love that idea of like you know the system you know if there's no risk there the reward is like the uh and I, i've often talked about it in the frame that players are motivated by mastery of systems and that comes from um both kind of like a game design perspective but also kind of like uh my education background where i know students are often motivated by the sense yeah. of mastery. Not every student, it's one of the mastery. It's one of the motivations, but it's what, a big one. one. Of, it's a big one, yeah. So yeah. like, you know, that, that student goes home and to play, play guitar in their room, they're not doing it because they're gonna get like a good grade out of it necessarily, but because they like the idea that they're getting better at it and mm-hmm. they're mastering the skill. Yeah, a lot of games like um, that are fairly difficult for new players, like Dota, League of Legends, stuff like that. Like yeah. MOBAs tend to have that thing where it's like, they attract a lot of mastery driven players because it takes investment to play. Yeah. And, and I think that it's really important in hard mode games to understand that if mastery is part of like the positive experience for a player, that you set them up that they can master the system, which goes back to consistency. You can't master a system if the if the GM is always changing the system. There's no way to like perfect it. Yeah. Yeah. So if, you know, I, I would actually recommend for a lot of people that are doing hard mode games to start off with, don't randomize things like HP for monsters. Every yeah. single goblin yeah. skirmisher, let's say, always has seven hit points. I would even. I don't even randomize damage. Yeah, I, I do standard damage. I don't oh, want to roll more dice. Oh, interesting. Yep. Yeah. I think it's just like it's too swingy, and I don't mind standard damage for monsters. It's one less thing I have to roll. Hmm? Yep. Uh, fourth edition introduced that with minion characters. Yeah, which I really. Thirteenth Age has uh, some yeah. goons too in it. They're really good. And I'm not I, familiar with it. What does so in a minion character or another type of like julian's um kind of uh variant here as soon as you make the attack roll and it hits just call it four damage like don't even roll anything just call it four damage move on from there it's really helpful for players because now a player can be like okay i know that monster does six damage it's consistent six damage i have seven hit points Mm -hmm. i can take the risk or i have five hit points and this means enough to crit. me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's, still some, crit, there's yeah. still some variant because if they crit, I generally like either double it or I just like, I roll crits mm-hmm. for damage to give it a little randomness because... what? A, uh, so for this campaign that you're going to be running, are you going to be rolling? I'm not going to roll damage probably. Okay. I don't think going into it, I... I pers- but wouldn't it be harder if they can't tell? I personally have... Well, I have the spoilers. I personally <laughs> have... Um, I'm a big fan of doing less as a DM and like <laughs> especially... Well, yeah, I'd like... I have a million homebrew play, rules on my play right now, so I'm gonna not roll damage because I want to be able to write a note that says I deal seven, and I want to take the time. Also, I think personally, it's really good for streams because it speeds things up. Yeah, and anything right. you can do in a stream to speed things up. Before we move on from the death too much, I have read a death rule that I kind of like. Um, I think it's by the Angry GM, who I find a contentious figure online, um, but they. Uh, they do have some cool stuff they think of sometimes, and one was that they said they um, make players roll death saves in secret. After the battle, they'll ask the player privately if they want their character to die or not, and what the result was. So they like they purposefully because like not everyone plays D and D for the same reason. Even when they're in the same game at the same table, and they think they're there for the same reason, some people are just like really attached to their characters, and they are like, you know what? I run difficult games, I run challenging games, but I always ask when the when the character's going to die in private if they want their character to die or not, and if they failed that those death saves and they still want their character to live, that character lives. They're like, I don't care. It's not worth ruining that player's time to stick to the rules that hardcore, even in the hardest of games. Mm-hmm. Um, especially if like one player wants to keep their character alive forever, but the other three don't. Let them kill themselves. I but. just remembered. I'm so full of shit. Uh, I did have. Yay! A, I did have a player whose character died, and she was actually a pretty good sport about it. And it was entirely her party's fault like she was it was like in this rushing like rapids river she was unconscious i was like she's drowning 
Um, and they made their own decisions. They, while well, they decided to keep fighting this water weird thing, and I was just like, "Well, okay." She and then she rolled, and she had a nat one, and she was already she, she a she already had two fails, and then she nat one. I was like, "You're dead. You drown." Yeah. And if it's not your fault, it's kind of like well, and I did not, and yeah, I did not feel any ounce of guilt. I was like. I'm like, y- you want to be mad? Be mad at them. And but she, and she like she was like she was like, why didn't you save me? But it was all in good strides, right? Like at the end of the day, it's a game. Yeah. It's a very very silly game, and which I love. And I ad- but like, and I think it's okay to take it seriously and like be passionate about it. But at the same time, sometimes I I have to tell my players I'm like, I think you should relax a little bit this is not real this is just fun storytelling and but i understand also Mm. being attached to that character uh in this case i was very fortunate my player she's like very easygoing she like took it in strides and she's like okay like you know this is a fun opportunity to like make a new role a new character and like yeah. you know bring that in that's what i got most of my players on because we're they're all part of an event a local adventuring guild so like i kind of did it to be like if you need to bring new characters in they can just be the background characters of this guild that we like have been here all along or something mm-hmm. like, you know like you can bring people in pretty easily mm-hmm. yeah. um that's an interesting one uh for how you're setting up your game in particular yeah which i think we should touch on but i'll prompt you to do that uh later because i think i'm gonna edit this a little bit uh, so what? I, us? Yeah. We're uh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> We're beautiful. We look like Linda Evangelista. We have we have some more uh, comments from Please. our new friend Chadzar in the chat, which is nice. Uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much. This is awesome to have yeah, uh, audience totally. feedback. So uh, Chadzar has been playing since 1982. Woo! And, girl! Uh, says that uh, they're not really interested in 5e uh, because it's like mostly going over their head right now, but... <laughs> They do like the uh, the GM prep streams, so uh, thank you for joining us here. Uh, we were talking a little bit earlier uh, and uh, uh, mentioned that uh, Steve might have been forgetting his roots as he's missing on, on the uh, hardcore mode of uh, AD&D uh, that was kind of lost in the modern D20 system with uh, Wizards of the Coast, and it doesn't exist at all in 5e, and kind of went on to talk about save or die petrification polymorph you know all these kinds of uh you know things that like the death saves in 5e negate the save or die mechanic 5e doesn't have any save or die kind of thing that's Mm -hmm. my intention because i think it's trying to be very approachable and kind of easy but it uh forces 5e into easy mode as the default right so yes i absolutely agree with that and i think it's funny because we talked about what motivates people and do people actually like hard mode and obviously they do because there is a huge revival right now of a ton of amazing like ad and d modded stuff going on in the world then like i follow a few people who are doing uh, on patreon and stuff that are doing like some really it's not usually my cup of tea because i've never played it i've never just spent the time to get into it but i am interested in it and i see a lot of people making cool ad and d stuff right now or variants of it or or things that are trying to bring back the spirit of it so clearly there is this huge 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 demand for it because people are making money off this yeah absolutely and I think, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think that's especially true for, especially like, you know, people like you who are very experienced and have played a lot. I think that's really cool. Yeah, shout out for that experience. Awesome. That's amazing. Yeah, like that's awesome. And I think like people like that are probably much more likely to want that kind of more of a challenge, right? Uh, Whereas uh, you're absolutely right, Ben, that, you know, 5e by design is to try and get like kind of broad market appeal, which I think is very smart. And I think it's a great way to get people. This is definitely the most newcomer friendly game we've ever seen them publish, despite it being a complicated mess of rules that I will endlessly critique till the day I die. It is. Um, It is complex. For It is most new player friendly Mm -hmm. compared to a lot of other them. There are there are there are much easier tabletop RPGs. I wish their design was a harder game that was easier to play, which I feel like is what AD&D kind of gets to. Right. Um, I wish that was kind of the way they went, because I don't think the barrier for entry for new players for D&D has ever been. It's too difficult. I think it's been it's too complicated. Yes. Um, so I don't know, and that that's what it wouldn't bother me so much if it wasn't this monolith that that was like ruling the market. 
because there are amazing other games that are harder to play and simpler um but i if it, it it's fortunately it's just like when you tell someone you're into tabletop rpgs or you play tabletop rpgs or design them they think oh D and i'm like oh, it's the grandfather that example <laughs> like even homebrewing it this much i constantly ask myself like and I, I ask other people when they homebrew a lot i'm like why don't you just play a better game and i'm like but i'm challenging myself to see how much i can stretch D. It's what I know my players are familiar with, so that familiarity is a really good base. I'm gonna push it. I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that question for myself. <laughs> yeah. This this is the this is what I call I've been calling the cupcake problem. And before I get into that, I'm gonna actually shout out to the Shazdar here. Um, if you're really interested in the OSR or the old school revival or Renaissance idea of old school D and I highly recommend that you join the OSR Discord. And the reason for that is because not only is it a group of people who love AD&D and and the B&W kind of setting of D&D, but it started to pull in kind of what I'm going to call the next generation of OSR developers. Yeah. Um, We're getting some interesting things where it's like, how do you marry the idea of like, oh, the Dungeon Master is kind of like your opponent, and how do we marry up to with the new idea of kind of like the narrative-driven ideas? Um, Some some big developers are part of that as well. Uh, Zach Sabbath has left that server, uh, for other reasons that we won't talk about on this stream. Nope. But uh, you will tell us later because I'm interested. <laughs> I'm going to tell you later. Yeah. Uh, but but it ha- it is a big font of information, and I think there's a big collaborative um, idea behind it all. That community has a lot of community guidelines and what have you, so I think it's also a safe space if you want to join, discuss ideas, and kind of develop uh, kind of the OSR spirit of Dungeons and Dragons, and but bring it into like a, a new modern lens. Thanks, Steve. That's really interesting. Uh, Sh- uh, Shatsar mentioned earlier uh, World of Darkness being uh, the game to play for like hardcore mode. So yeah. I just picked up, ah. I just picked up uh, Vampire: The Masquerade, and it's the fifth edition of the book. Uh, I've read through the entire thing. I am very interested in running it. It yeah. is so cool. They're very interesting games. My first ever RPG experience was like a semi-LARP of Changeling the Lost. It was like 15 people and I think three GMs. And we played in like a party room of an apartment. And we actually like, if you were talking with certain people, you'd get up and go to that area of the room. It wasn't like a full LARP where you're like in costume, but like we got up moved around. If we were having, a, if we were on a mission, we took those people and one of the GMs and we went somewhere else and did that mission. Like, you know, it was very interesting. Um, I think there is a, a level of challenge in those games that's really nice to explore. But, uh, White Wolf in general. Like, just what from what I got in, again, I have no experience playing it. I've only read the book and have started kind of working on the mechanics and stuff. Uh, the sense I get is also that it's very narrative driven as well. Yeah. So, like, we are talking about how narrative driven these games are. Like, I'm designing a really, we didn't really talk about it too much, but I want to talk about like what settings lend themselves to hard mode. I think it's a great place for it because look at like urban fantasy is a great setting to run a hard mode campaign, D&D, World of Darkness, whatever you want to do. Mm-hmm. Like where these like kind of like supernatural horrors can be lurking around every corner. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm personally doing something that's like kind of an analog to uh, my love of Zelda Wind Waker, but I'm doing like a desert campaign. So I want it to be like a wide open desert kind of area that's like places of uh, like villages and stuff are few and far between. It's definitely like, I'm gonna be tracking like food and water a bit and fatigue and stuff. Like there's gonna be some survivalistic elements and some foraging. I've got all these different areas so I planned out. That's really fun too. I think setting though can like, A, it's setting's pure narrative, but it can help your hard mode campaign so much. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think you hit it right on the, uh, the nail on the head. It's all about setting. It's about setting kind of like what kind of narrative you want to weave. And in my head, um, there are two really like great examples. One's pretty traditional and one's like super out there. I'm ready. But my traditional example is definitely Arkham Asylum, the board game. Because, oh, yeah. Because I, Cosmic I, Horror. I have Cosmic Horror, Horror, Thulu, Lovecraftian. Yeah. I have vivid memories of the first time I played Arkham Asylum. And I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. All the other players are like, Steve, do this. Otherwise, we all die. Yeah. And I'm like, cool. I don't get what's happening. But like, I had fun. And it was like a weird kind of warped fun where it was like, 
they had mastered the system and I was kind of along for the ride. And then the next time we played, all of a sudden I had mastered the system or I had gotten closer and now I'm calling the plays where I'm like, don't do that. You actually want to do this because of these reasons. And like together as a, as a team, we collaborated and the setting took that kind of what I'm going to call meta knowledge and allowed us to weave a narrative that made sense in kind of this setting. Uh, and that was like super fulfilling for me at least. And I think it was fulfilling for the rest of the players as well. And I had the exact same experience with that board game where I got my ass handed to me with it. Yeah. And I had so much fun because the setting is so good. Yes, exactly. Uh, that's really interesting where like a good setting can actually save maybe a game where the mechanics aren't as polished as they should be. Yeah. And uh, hot take, Arkham Asylum is not a good board game. No. Uh, <laughs> I think it's actually but quite it. bad. There's other, there's other iterations that I think are better. Um, but Arkham Asylum wins all the awards for good setting, good like pieces that feed into the narrative. It just is so, so harmonious and kind of all the elements. Um, cool. I'm going to jump back in here mm. while we're uh, taking a, a moment to think on. Uh, we were talking about barriers to entries earlier. Yeah. Uh, Shatzar commented that the only barrier to entry is your own imagination, which I think is uh, very uh, accurate in its own uh, sweet kind of way, too. Uh, if mean, you uh, went on to say, if you lack one, then uh, you won't be able to play any game. D&D, another RPG, other tabletop games, probably. Uh, AD&D's barrier to entry was that uh, what made people stop playing Candyland and started playing tabletop games. So there wasn't any sort of barrier to entry, per se, until recently people coming from MMOs and other video games wanted those same kinds of experiences and uh, when RPGs uh, give a you know much more broader simpler experience so they don't just babysit you with all the visual and the math and the computer chips I think that is such a good um, that is such a good way of putting it because um, I'm currently running a game with some fairly inexperienced players right now and that is definitely what I'm sensing from some of them is just like they'll do they'll make a decision or they'll say something even even the words they say I'm like that's because you play games that's because you're like a video gamer yeah I need to kind of you definitely need to let go I don't think it's the only barrier of entry because like no I don't try and run either, a, but... the first combat with six people who have never played D and D in their life or any RPG and you'll be there for three hours pulling your hair out <laughs> there is a barrier of entry that's just complication. Um, or not complication, but like how long it takes people to learn, which is variable depending on their abilities. And depending, um, yeah, and people learn different things at how different they rates. Learn, yeah. yeah, all that kind of stuff. But I, I think a big barrier with new players or old players or old gamers alike, anyone's coming into this is, yeah, they kind of don't get that like, say, say what you want to do, like try it, be creative, do anything. Think about what your character's motives are. You don't have to think mechanically like a video game anymore. Yeah, and, and that's something uh, I actually designed an exercise in role playing because I think that was one aspect that, because I think if you're able to role play, then you're better able to step into your character's shoes, better able to think like, you know, what are creative things that I can do to try and solve this problem or, you know, to just experience this game more fully. And so I designed like just like a little exercise where I gave each one of them, this is your character, this is how you're going to play it. And like, and you have to do it. Oh, I love this because I really think LARP is like the gateway people need between like either video games or no, no knowledge to like art tabletop RPGs. I ran a LARP for my birthday last year. It was like, an, it's a specific LARP you need nine people exactly it's called um oh my gosh it's called inheritance it's by luke crane the developer of burning wheel and uh, mouse guard um and he only released this like once and i luckily back the kickstarter and have a pdf of it and it's you play like a uh, a nordic funeral in like in, in a historical setting that's kind of parallel to Iceland and like everyone gets a character and you're like you're the you're this part you're the uncle you're the disgraced son who's returned to claim their inheritance when you're and it's all your the grandfather's funeral the patriarch has died everyone wants a piece of it there's like one priest who's trying to convert people to Catholicism there's one like you know uh, like backwoods witch of the old ways there's like all this drama and you just get a character sheet and it gives you like a uh, all your motives who you know secret information 
information you might know. There's no rolling dice. There's no anything. It kind of sounds yeah. almost like a like one of those uh, murder mystery. It type, is very murder mystery. Which I, if you've ever played, they're so fun. It gave they're a lot so of really fun. cool mechanics too, which I know I'm on a tangent, but like the matriarch of the house, literally for the dinner scene, could tell like she could tell people if they're allowed to sit down or not. And when she said dinner was over, dinner was over. And when she said everyone went to bed for night scenes, everyone had to like quit. Like they literally gave you some kind of narrative privileges based on the privileges your character might have. Mm. And like as the patriarch of the house, you're you're like in charge of everyone's safety. So if someone dies, it's your fault. Yeah. Like but it's very old Viking culture. Yeah. Right? The, the matriarch is the head of the house. Exactly. Yeah. But that kind of game got people and got some of my friends. All, Every, almost everyone who played in that game, which a lot of them had never played a LARP or an RPG in their lives, like most of them now play D&D. Some yeah. with me regularly, and it's like so freaking nice. Like it was the best gateway I could have provided because it got them using their imagination so that the mechanics could come after. Uh, that is such a, like now I want to do that. Because yeah. I think well, it's you were, such a, you did literally, you created and a, I did, like, and, and I didn't have them roll something. dice. I was like, you want to do something? Describe it to me. I, you have your character sheet. So you know what special like abilities you can have, but just if you want to try and do something, tell me and how well you describe it, I will determine if it's successful or not. Yeah. Like, absolutely. uh, and it was, it was successful. But it's still it's still a work in progress, right? Because it's hard. Cause like for me, I'm a naturally very like overly dramatic person, and role playing comes very easy because I'm always doing it like a little. <laughs> oh, I know. I think it was shocking. I had someone who was like really experienced with role playing in RP games. I, there were two people, um, and one of them was a priest and wanted to baptize the other person. And literally, they got like a bucket and a jug of water from my house and a towel. And I saw it at the corner of my eyes on the other side of my apartment happening. And like all my friends who had never done any of these before were like, is he going to baptize her for real? They did not in the end because he was like, I think it would have bothered everybody so much. But like, it's so funny because like it gets so much easier. Like people get so dramatic and it's so fun. Yeah. I love unlocking that in them. And exactly. And it, it's something, I think the first step is just realizing like, stop, stop being so subconscious about how you act. And I think that's one thing people have a lot of trouble with. Yeah, there's the social anxiety. Social anxiety, which I totally understand. Whereas for me, like that's, how I get rid of social anxiety. I'm a naturally very anxious person, but role playing makes it easier. It's like, it's not me. It's not me, it's someone else. Yep. I, I love that we talked about LARP for a little bit. So my, my story for LARP is uh, two years ago at Con Bravo in Hamilton, uh, there was a lot of LARP sessions going on. And I was like, let's just, let's just give it a try. First one I joined, Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th is everyone is in a room, lights turn off, one person gets the hockey mask and the machete toy. So you wear the mask and you have the machete. And the rule is as Jason, you can only lumber around the room. And the moment you touch someone, it's camp counselor, you kill them. And then all the counselors are bought into, they're like, if Jason touches you, you die. And then they have to figure out like puzzles around the room and figure out where like the, the, the clues and stuff are around the room to figure it out. But the lights are all off. So there is a flashlight somewhere in the room, but they might stumble on it, they might not. We played twice, it was great. And that sounds terrifying, It Wonderful. was great, and I got to play as Jason on the first one, and I was really into it. And I remember just like, um, like lumbering around, and one time I actually hid underneath the table, hmm? and when someone walked by, and they were just standing there, because of safety, I grabbed their ankle, and I pulled myself out with the hockey mask, and that person uh, pooped their pants. They just like, just poop everyone, and they didn't do that. But but it was such like I would have, and the best part was that the and the pant leg I grabbed got warm. Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> the the what I was trying to get at was that when it comes to LARP or any kind of role playing, props actually really really help to bring people into the yeah. narrative. For Jason, having an actual mask helps you because the human brains are weird. Helps you actually mask yourself and become whatever it is helps you're supposed get into to be. It. Yeah, um, one of my players actually suggested something similar. They're like, I think next, I think when we play, we should have outfits. Yeah. And I was like, if you feel like that'll help you get into your character, fuck yeah, do it. Yeah. Like, it's a really good suggestion. The, the the moment I'll never forget in that game was, um, I, I, as Jason, had killed a camp counselor, and I, without any prompting, they just begged for their life and just screamed and freaked everyone out. 
And I was like, this is a player who knew what was happening in the narrative. And obviously I wasn't murdering them. I was just touching but them on the shoulder. Like, yeah, but they, they were like, immersed. Yeah, they were like immersed. They were having fun. And they were like, this enriches the experience for everyone else, which it did. And I was like, you know, this is a power of these games that we play that mm -hmm. you wouldn't get from, to, to bring it back to Shazar's point, from like World of Warcraft. No one screams bloody yeah. murder and begs for their life while playing oh, World absolutely. Warcraft. They scream because they're mad that someone didn't do something right or whatever. But yeah, it's a We're different, like, yeah, it's a different kind. They, they're screaming at the priest. Yeah. Um, I really like that. I mean, we've gotten onto like quite a tangent, but like it's definitely like it's the power of narrative, the power of imagination, how much that stuff like I think so much of running a hard mode campaign is appealing too because it's not just like your oh challenging mechanics. It's like it's kind of the narrative of hard mode is appealing. You want to be doing something challenging and just like you were talking about like that LARP sounded really terrifying, but people were like, I'm into it. I want a challenge and I want the narrative that comes with that challenge and the perseverance of finding out who this person is and surviving. Like surviving is is such a fantasy and I think that's what I'm gonna try and do with my game is like have this very unforgiving world and they are like trying to save it and survive within it and like really push that and like Ultimately, for me, the huge appeal is to make these great, like, life or death situations, which are super dramatic. And, like, what do you do? Can you save this person? Can you do this? Do you sacrifice yourself to do this? Like, I want to know the answers to those questions, how far they're willing to go. I don't know. So, so the other th setting that I really like, that I think might kind of, like, get some gears going. Yeah, you said you had a second. That was, like, The, the second setting right, right. For, for a survival that I love, because it's... You look at it and you're like, that's not like a survival horror or like it's not a hard mode thing, is the setting of Banner Saga. And Banner Saga, usually people don't see as like a hard mode type thing because in the narrative, the sun never sets. Uh, it's mm -hmm. always daytime there, which I love because that actually is, in my opinion, uh, in my experience, like a throwback to old Japanese horror films because the horror is always in broad daylight because the sunlight isn't like a savior for you. You're not safe, even though it's daytime. Which is almost scarier. It's almost scary, it, in my opinion, like it terrifies me. Mm -hmm. uh, Banner Saga was great because the narrative of that was you play these heroes and what have you, but it doesn't matter how strong you are, or how great you are, you are beholden to your caravan who are civilians. Some of them might be fighters, but they're mostly civilians and you have to manage their food, their water, and if you don't do it properly, people start dying or they leave yeah. or they uprise, they mutiny. <sighs> and like, you totally could just get from point A to point B on your own. But the narrative is, can I get to point A to point B with my chosen family? And yeah. that's, that's like a, that's a, a story that if your players want to tell, mm -hmm. that idea of like leading a caravan from A to B can be like really meaningful to them. Especially when they have to make hard decisions, like, you know, this care, this you know, tribe of who you would assume would be ne'er do wells, they beg to join your caravan, but you know that there's not enough food to go around. So, do you risk the well-being of everyone else to bring in these mm -hmm. people who could actually be a risk? And your character is not at risk of dying at all. Like, if they turn, if they get uppity. Like, you're a warrior. You're probably going to survive it. The risk really is. Will will your bad decision have lasting ramifications yeah. on the well being of others who you know look up to you as their caretaker? There's that zombie board game. I forget the name of it. Um, long no, Long Dark's a video game. Last night something like that. There's like so, the yeah. The, uh, there's yeah. a zombie video game or a zombie board game. Sorry, where you take on survivors into your base and they require food. Yes, um, yes, yes. yes, and you have to have like I'll a tip my tongue. Yeah, and long and, winter. I think it's long yeah, winter. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, it is like it that. is during the winter, and you have to like when you eat that you also accumulate garbage, and you have to get rid of that. Yeah, or else they attract zombies and stuff. They're yeah. like bears. Yeah, I, I like that, and I've I've don't want to give away too much to uh, any players watching. Cause I think Jay still watching this but um just like i'm excited to present them with problems that aren't just a monster attacks i'm excited, excited to present them with problems like there's precious food and water but it's at risk and like where are you going to try it or like there's people that need your help and they need your food and water or they need your resources or especially like there's people you normally wouldn't trust like maybe there's bandits but they're like desperate and deserted and need water like 
what are your decisions here? Do you take on people who you normally would be fighting against and share your resources that are precious to you as well? Like, I'm so excited to see what they do in those situations with those really difficult, crunchy things. Like, that to me is my hard mode dream. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm excited to see how it goes. I super am. Um, I'm excited too. I think our name of it is going to be The Heroes of Valto's Crossing because Valto's Crossing is going to be this trade hub that they start in. And uh, yeah, I'm super. I had so much. Like, their characters are also so much fun. In the spirit of hard mode, I let them roll things if they wanted. And I gave them like benefits. So if they rolled their like either their race class or background, I gave them ten gold. If they rolled two things, I gave them like an extra skill point. And if they rolled three things, I gave them an extra ability point. So like some of my players were like none of that. Some of them are like all three, please. Yeah. So I have some really cool random characters, but they've created these really cool stories with why they want to be a part of this world and what they're protecting. Like one of my players is a halfling who uh, her family's orphan and she has like something like nine siblings that are all younger than her that she wants to take care of. And she's like this like down to brass tacks, super practical and serious halfling and all of her like jokey, funny young halfling siblings are like her burden to bear and she feels so responsible for them. And I'm like, oh God, if that character dies, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> that, oh. Um, I feel like they're you, really good. They're, I feel like really you've just characters. foreshadowed, like I feel like now she is going to die. No, I don't want it to happen. Um, I, I wanted to, to bring it so close. Ben, do we have any other audience questions or anything like that that's come up over the chat that we want to address? Uh, uh, sh yeah, Shazdar uh, just mentioned, uh, I'll just mention a couple things. Please. Uh, that, uh, so for, uh, for Patrick, I think mostly about when you're talking about Vampire the Masquerade, uh, they didn't know the Changeling was part of Mind's Eye Theater, only saw Vampire and Werewolf. Uh, ooh myself for LARP play or is that OKs? I don't know what that was supposed to be, sorry. Uh, if you want even more mystery narrative, The Chill is a great game that does both. Uh, and then uh, it Chill really captures the role playing game that captures the feel of the 20th century horror. Ooh, I'd uh, like to look at that. Patrick, you should expect heavy combat for from Vampire because uh, that's the thing Werewolf does. Vampires heavy RP elements. Okay. So. Yeah, Vampire, like, in Vampire, one thing is they don't have six stats. They have nine. Yeah, that uh, was with Changeling when I played it. Yeah, so... Whatever they, edition I played. and Which is great. And then the number of skills they have is huge. Like, and yeah. it's not just like, oh, roll persuasion. It's like, we have etiquette. We have persuasion we have subterfuge we have like it's yeah it's much more nuanced and complex There's a lot of fine grain in there mm -hmm. but it makes sense for like a huge political dramatic game and it is very political like vampire yeah. masquerade is like the hard mode not for mechanical combat stuff but like it's like a hard mode for a political campaign like it's like really interesting that they've created a hard mode for narrative where like yeah. your little mistakes and slip ups can get you killed so easily in vampire setting absolutely everything is like face and 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 social value and social presence and your rank and stuff and the different vampire clans like yeah it's gonna be i i, think should run. I definitely definitely in the future i want to run like i would like to run a, like a game like on this stream, I think would be really fun. Uh, like in the future, I'd like to kind of go through like the different clans and like and a bit a bit of a bit of like the history. Hey, of future the world. chat shows, right? I, oh yeah, absolutely. You could, you could do multiple chat shows just on the history and lore of oh, for Masquerade. Sure. Um, That's, uh, sorry, that was uh, only saw Vampire and Werewolf books myself for LARP play. So that sentence makes a lot more sense. But <laughs> thank, thanks, uh, Chatzar, for clarifying. Uh, Shadzar also mentions uh, when we were talking about uh, getting your characters into their roles, uh, how a lot of characters or players rather uh, can get into role assumption where, you know, you hand them a character sheet. Uh, some people can be kind of become a part, but they're not interested in, say, role playing per se. Uh, like they can see themselves in the tavern doing something, but like they may not narrate their actions in the third party or the first priority to like act as in a film but yeah. I thought that was an interesting point about you know handing someone a role like Patrick's mm. prompt and seeing how people are much more able to easily pick that up yeah and it's because I didn't give them the choice like usually when 
I'm playing out at the table, you know, and it's true that there's, there are some people, they don't, they're not really good at like role playing in the sense that they're in the first person and like, like, blah, 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 like, you know, talking in yeah, a voice. Yeah, you ask them what they say to their NPC to convince them and they look at their character sheet for a stat. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, no, 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 just tell me. Yeah, and, and even if you don't know exactly what they would say, you know, let's say you're you're playing a bard who's super charismatic and you want to like say something that will seduce this person but in real life you're terrible at that sort of thing like that's fine you can just say like well what kind of thing do you th like what are the elements you would hit to try and like what would you bring up to try and like get that out of them um i think that's totally fine because you know role play is also a skill and it's something that takes practice for this particular thing because it was an exercise like I told them like you don't have a choice you have to do this because this is what we're working on today <laughs> well it can be very different too like I even as as a player in your games like I'm a very different DM I don't do any voices and I narrate mostly in third person mm -hmm. it's just my style and I still put a lot of heart into my role play and I have like I can, I've had some very like great scenes that I've had with my players and stuff where they've been giving back too. like, and I've like, it just, it's all style. Like you don't, if you're worried about it, if you're socially anxious, like you don't have to throw a voice on. Um, no, absolutely. I remember Steve talking about this, about yeah. your anxiety is about making a voice for your character. Yeah. It's, it's been 15 years and I still don't do voices for my characters because yeah. one time I did a voice and I had someone actually like really dig into me, like make fun of me for the voice. And they were like, that's a terrible so-and-so accent. And ever since that day, I've never done a voice ever again. Cause I'm like- Traumatized. Great. I'm like, I'm never gonna yeah. do a voice again. I, the moment I gear up myself to it, I get cold, like wet feet and I'm like, it's not gonna happen. And I find it makes, it's, it's more suited for games sometimes that are a little more fun and funny. Yeah. Cause like characters- Which is very, there. which is very my style. We laugh at your voice all the time, but like Absolutely. with you, usually you make fun of them first before any of us do. Exactly. Like um, that is my style. Like I like, I like having a lot of jovial and like comedy in, in my But it in helps make your, it helps make your NPCs more nuanced. It's very nice. Like it, it does. It, it and it, it also, I find for like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like, you know, there's a lot of levity and stuff, but then when a dramatic moment does happen, it's really like, oh yeah, shit. Yeah, exactly. Like, there's a way to it. Yeah. It always helped me. Um, I always have strong visuals for your characters because of the voice, I think. Well, we, that's the thing. All DMs have different strengths, right? Like one thing I would, I continuously say is like, I'm really bad at describing like the look of a place of a location. I'm like, it's like gray. <laughs> <laughs> So There's this is like a stone? this is a crazy thing that I deal with because I have uh, this weird thing called aphantasia where I don't picture things in my head very well. Like I cannot picture. Like I've talked to my partner about it, and when I talk about D and D stuff and I describe a room, I'll write down like four bullet points about the room, and I don't picture it ever. I just like oh, it has leaky pipes and concrete walls, and it's this dark. And then Jace will be like, I imagine every corner of that room in my head. And I have like a map of it and I picture it and I can hold it and I'm like, that's called dreaming. That's not what I do or can do. So like I get by on DM and like none of my players have ever noticed I've had this kind of weird change in the way I picture things, but like I cannot picture a full room in my mind's eye. So my thing is like the complete opposite of that. Oh, because, wow. I, because yeah. I can see it so clearly in my head, but I don't have the vocabulary or Oh, or, wow, you're lost for words because you're like, it's so word. specific. Yeah, I'm lost for words or I'm just like, I'm not sure how to say it in a way that I want them to see it exactly how I see it. I think it helps me because it gives me, it, it frees me from that. Like, I yeah. think it's a, it's a benefit a lot of times. Absolutely, I'm I jealous. That. Sometimes it leads to problems as a player because like the DM has a very specific vision and I'm like, if you didn't tell me this lever's here to pull, I don't know. Like I, if there's a map that's better, but like I'm not picturing it. You said there's a bale of hay and <laughs> a pig and some manure. So I'm thinking about there's, I've like, I have a checklist in my head of what I can interact with. Like one of those old fucking RPGs done on <laughs> DOS, <laughs> right? Like yeah. that's like, <laughs> that's my imagination is DOS. Um, that's a really great point too. I, yeah. I think in terms of like how people approach things, because uh, Julian, you approach things more like as if you were reading or writing the adventure. Like if you were yes. DM prepping, you would have bullet points like that about the things that you need to sit mention to interact with. Whereas Patrick uh, is able to maybe it's more of a like a freeform thing where that's more 
building your own world because you just imagine the place Ooh. and you f it feels real to you so you're able to uh, extemporaneously make up things as it happens. Yeah, but, I kind of like emote it. Yeah. I'll do even like a list of adjectives. Like if I, for my prep, like if I have a location, I'll just come up with 10 adjectives. See, I love that. I, and I'll just I should I'll do pull that. from it and I'll just be like, oh yeah, this is like, so you know, if for all the different towns and villages in my setting, I gave them like eight adjectives. For all the dungeons, I gave them like eight adjectives. And I didn't really map any of them out or go into long descriptions, but I know their general vibe and I know like one or two good details about them that are like really like visible and like, you know, maybe they have a huge entranceway with like carvings of stars on them. Something like I, I come up with like one or two key things and then just a list of adjectives for the rest. And like, that's generally what I go into for any kind of like town or anything they're going into. I keep a real loose, I'm a real uh, like low prep DM. I like to improv a lot. Well, now we're really getting to the really hot DM tips now. With, I know, uh, right? You know, we're, we're riffing on each other's preps and getting new fun ideas. Uh, one thing you mentioned was like not knowing whether the lever was there or not. And I find that's a very common thing with say, different players styles more than maybe the dms because the dm might kind of set the room and then your play style might expect them to ask questions about the room to reveal whether the lever's there or not whereas other players might kind of just be like well you didn't mention it so it, it's, it doesn't exist but there's still a trust like yeah. i i also it gives it gives both ways because it also allows like i don't know i always like when players insert things into the room like when it's not there to begin with. If you're saying there's a tavern scene, you might not have planned that there's someone I can get this information. I'll, like I might be like, oh, I'm looking for someone from this guild that's really intoxicated. And you might be like, I might tell you what I want to do. And you're like, I didn't plan to have every, like I didn't think of every NPC here, but like, I like where you're going. Yes, they exist. Mm -hmm. Or like, is there a chandelier I can grapple from? Yeah. Maybe I didn't say there was, but if you're gonna like swing from a chandelier, I'm gonna make sure there's one in the room. And I always say that like too, is like, they're like, is like, well, is there one of these? I was like, well, what are you planning to do? And they'll they'll describe it. I'm like, I'm like, then hell yeah, there's one. There you go. Yeah, intent changes things. I think that's with you too. Like I, when you find, I think it's more players not realizing they have that much agency. Mm -hmm. I'm always trying to tell them again and again. I've been playing Blades in the Dark, and um, one of the things it does is when you go into a score, like a heist in it, you're, you play as a gang. And when you do a job, you jump to the action right away. Like you do very brief planning, you make a roll, and it decides how you start kind of in the middle of things, and the roll determines if you're fucking up or if you're doing really well. And then to make up for the fact that you don't plan, you do flashback scenes. So it gives the players a lot of agency and they are so lost on what to do with it. I'm like, you can literally go back and say that like, do a flashback where you paid off one of the guards. Or if you got one of your gang members to pose as a worker at the docks, or you installed a bomb on the bottom of this carriage. Like you can do flashbacks and say you did that stuff. That's and then so powerful. But they're like, they're so nervous. The first game I played of it, they're like, oh, I don't want to, that feels weird and retconny and I'm like, but like I love giving players more agency, so it was like I pushed them, and like we got to some really cool stuff with it. Yeah. So I have recently started playing with that kind of player agency and player world building, uh, using the alternative rule in the DMG called plot points. Ooh, yeah, yeah, very. very so you can first. you can codify the idea of you know players taking control of the narrative and saying something that you didn't describe as the GM, but actually is happening there. So a great example is you know. They're in a chase scene and they use a plot point to say, actually, my uncle lives around the next corner. Oh. We're going to hide out there. And actually, what, there's a secret ca like tunnel I can escape through, you know? Absolutely. Like there's, oh yeah, that's such a good way to. So what I do is every session and I, I specifically make it session, they get a plot point. And if they don't use it, whatever, you get one next session, but I want them to use it. Yeah. Um, the last time I did this, because I was with a group who I wasn't confident would ever use their plot points, um, I brought in like a ceramic bowl and a set of matches and I said, if you use a plot point, we're gonna burn it right here and we're gonna set it on fire. And the reason I did that was because I want them to always know that, you know, there's the experience of Steve setting something on fire in this room. We were in the office that oh, we were working. Oh, I love that. Um, it was a fire hazard and I had a stern talking to from one of my office managers about setting fires in the office. I know, <laughs> that's fine. But and my fire. players will never forget it. Mm. And to this day, I would say of my four players, one, plot, one to two plot points is burned every single session. 
because they know it's there. They know if they don't use it, they don't get any benefit out of it. And they want to see you light something on fire. And they want to see me light something on fire. Uh, actually, I don't do it anymore. I was like, it was a one-time thing. Now you know what, what's going to happen. But you trained them. I trained them. It did. It's a Pavlovian response now. Absolutely. The the only thing, the, the book DMG has more specific rules about it and how to codify yeah. it. Yeah. But I wanted to keep it lightweight for them. And I said, anything that would make the narrative more interesting, a plot point can do. So I gave him an example. It was like, if we're fighting against like your arch nemesis and you decide to use your plot point to give him a heart attack, it's not that interesting. It's kind of like, it kind of defeats the tension. But if you use your plot point to say, actually, I kept a knife in my boot when I got patted down yeah. for weapons and I actually snuck one in, I think we can all agree like that's way more exciting. So yeah, let's let that happen. And my players really kind of resonated with that and it really helped them to visualize how to use those. Well, here's the thing with hard mode too. I think like hard mode is an easier pill to swallow and has to be married with like some benefits too. Like I think you have to shine light where you spread darkness here. Like it's like when you are making the game this dire, it's kind of, you can, you can introduce cooler stuff like that without it making the game too easy because on the other side, you're up in the challenge. And that's one thing I'm really excited to do. Mm -hmm. Like the whole making death saves really punishing, but giving every player a fate point to start where they can cheat death ones. Like letting them have, like giving them some advantages. One of the things I'm doing too is um, I'm letting them use intelligence and wisdom for social checks. Um, I'm gonna see, so if they wanna have like a debate with someone, I'll check intelligence persuasion. If they are using empathy, I might do wisdom persuasion or wisdom, deception, like so, whatever it is, and make like some of these lesser, because D&D &D has a huge problem where like strength, dex, charisma, that's all you need. Um, and I, I'm trying to come up with like, I'm trying to make these other stats a little more relevant. Um, so yeah, and that's a huge advantage, but like, it's gonna help them out when they have these social scenes because otherwise their life is hell. I like that. I like the balancing both sides. One thing about those social scenes that D&D, &D, again, is not the best at is if you use the variant rules of, um, you know, long rest and what have you, it's gonna make it really difficult for the bard or whoever to be like, I'm gonna burn a suggestion or a spell slot to like yeah. influence this social scene, which means social scenes are now built around people's ability scores which you know might not be necessarily what certain classes are designed for so you have to worry about that so i kind of like that because like i think it cheapens the experience a little bit when you got that bard who every social scene is like friends suggestion all this stuff like i want them to be like save that for the times you need it yeah so i was talking with uh, another dm about this earlier to the stream and we're talking about how social encounters actually are a lot less structured than combat encounters. Yeah. So it's actually less consistent, pulling it back to what I was talking about earlier, uh, for the players. So if something doesn't go their way in a social scene, um, there's a chance that they're going to feel kind of betrayed by the system. Like, you know what? I thought this was going to happen. It didn't. I thought I made a really compelling argument, but then I made the role. It didn't work out my way and we're screwed now. So we were talking about in the book, it talks about renown and reputation. Yeah. Uh, and how if a hard mode game is really based on resource management, why not give them a social resource that they can use to help burn? And I think Renown, although in the DMG is not a great system in my opinion, I think using a Renown system to give them a pool of ways to throw around their social weight interesting, might help them kind of sway the odds in their favor so they can, can, they can invest when they need to invest and then kind of leave it up to chance when it's okay to leave it and, and fail in those situations. Very, in yeah, I actually really like that idea. Um, bringing it back to Vampire the Masquerade in the rules for that, like, uh, so you're talking about how, you know, role play interactions are a lot less structured than combat, mm -hmm. very much so in 5e, but then in V5, it's, it's like a battle. Yeah, you have like a social defense and you, a social attack stat. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's it's very much the same. It's like, you know, you, you come up with a witty retort. Oh, this, you know, then everyone suddenly, and you're in, at court and everyone sees you do that. And it's so cool. Yeah. Uh, I think it's yeah. a great way that structure can help it. Like, I like to use um, borrow from fourth edition when they had these skill challenges where it was like you set different DCs and different skill challenges they had to pass. And if they did really well, it might make the next roll easier for them. Or if they do really badly, it makes the next roll harder. And sometimes I'll set up social encounters very numerically, 
where I might be like, this guy likes you at a plus one. To get him to do this, he needs to get to plus three. And every successful roll you put, you do puts it up one. If you um, use uh, one of the secrets you know about him well, it gets an, a bonus. Like you know, I'm, I'll make it very mechanical because sometimes social can favor the talkative players, mm -hmm. and someone who is shyer might have like a you know 18 charisma, but because they're not thinking of the point to say, it's like well now they don't look like they're the most charismatic person. So I, I like to make them more numerical sometimes just to make them as like a little mini encounter and give those people with high stats something to do. Yeah, I think that's a really good, I'm, t I'm taking so much away from this guy. <laughs> I, know, I'm, I don't I'm know if you guys are. A ton but... here. Um, I'm learning a ton from this conversation. Yeah. Um, One thing about this kind of social encounter that I really like from Apocalypse World or any game that's powered by the apocalypse um, is the idea that you know, if you are, if you have 18 charisma or you're very, very good in something, you just do it. You just always can do it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I like that. But there's that. degrees of failure. So you still do a roll. No matter what the outcome, you're going to convince that guard that, hey, let us into, this, let this, convince this bouncer to listen to the bar. No matter what is going to happen because your charisma is so high. Yeah. But if you roll poorly, maybe something doesn't go the way you expected. There's a complication. There's a complication. And the game codifies that and empowers the GM or the DM to say, okay, they didn't roll great. So now you have, so this is your prompt to say, okay, you get into the bar, but make it a little more difficult. Give them something they weren't expecting. Twist it in a way to make it more interesting for the players. So maybe they get into the bar and all of a sudden that person and, and the party who wanted to kind of sneak in someone's mistaken for like a celebrity and yeah. all of a sudden the, the spotlight's on them now they are in the bar like they wanted but not in the way they necessarily expected you gave something up i'm yeah. using something similar where like i'm using a, a consequence rule where if you're like within three of hitting a skill check i'll i'll let you succeed if yeah. you sacrifice something it's so like either it's hit points or it's a nice item or it's like that healing potion you were saving or it's you take like you mm -hmm. know this you get what you want but this person thinks really badly of you now or something off screen happens bad to, that will come up later yeah. i'm gonna be playing around with that a little bit i think if you if you like that idea of like hope points like hp is hope when something goes bad you can give up a yeah. little bit about your hope yeah and like it's a little more bleak now you still take did a little it. extra stress or something you know exactly yeah, yeah. so it's, it's even more of an arbitrary kind of representation of what it means to be alive but that might actually be the narrative that maybe is a little more richer for the people. I like that. I wanted to wrap this up soon, but I want to touch on one last thing um, that we kind of mentioned before and I think is a good wrap up kind of thing, uh, which is how you respond to when things go wrong in your games or how like these, we've talked a lot about the negative experience we can have with hard mode. And um, I really like talking about um, aftercare and and wrap up sessions. Like you were saying, you had this really great group that did this. I I love to do um, like Mouse Guard had a really good built in rule system where you reviewed your session and talked about your favorite moments and gave experience points for it. Um, I like to do stars and wishes. Just like everyone, what's something you loved and what's something you want more of? Mm -hmm. Like what's your star? What's your wish? Um, just checking in with players, making sure like. If their character died or is something terrible happened to them, they're okay with it. They're not like stressed about it. They're not enjoying the game less. They're not checking out. I don't know. What kind of things do you guys like to do afterwards to make sure to fix things and make sure things are good? So this is something that I haven't done a lot of and, and I'm kind of like almost ashamed of it. Uh, because well, it's not recommended anywhere like where this is just us discovering it. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's kind of the sort of thing. It's like realizing, oh, the players do have feelings about these things. And it's something that actually has come up again, like in the game that I'm kind of running right now with this group of people, most of whom are very, very new to this. And, you know, there's like tension between the group, like between like the different players and just like really like minor silly things really when you when like you examine them uh but uh you know a lot of silly th or, like those things were building up and you know uh resentment start to build because we're not letting it out and we're not expressing it in a healthy way and then it just kind of you know becomes awkward and uncomfortable so i so part of that exercise that i mentioned in like the role play it was also like a family meeting and i was like we're gonna have a group therapy session i'm going to tell you now like this is how i want to run the game from a player like standpoint like this is how i want you guys to approach 
something like if you don't feel comfortable about something, if you're upset about something I did, if you're upset about something another player did, like I want us to have an open dialogue. We're all friends. Just say it and yeah. say it in a respectful way, but say it and then we can resolve it then and there and then great. It's like your session zero, but it's like after games. And yeah, stuff like that. yeah, exactly. And anyway, so I'm, I'm just now starting to realize how important it is because, you know, I've had I've had sessions before, like in the past where I know people all had like an issue with one player in particular. And this is like years ago. And, you know, it never we never brought it up. We never like talked about it. And it was it was becoming a problem. Like we were like, you know, we were developing resentments and we were mm -hmm. and like this player didn't have any idea because we were too chicken shit to talk about it. It's hard. It's not easy. It's not easy. I mean, it's good advice in general, like just how to have like interpersonal relationships. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's something I'm only now working on. And yeah, it's very it's very useful. I'm so happy that you're you felt safe enough to be like, I'm ashamed I haven't done feedback sessions when literally for me, I've only started doing feedback sessions in a structured way for the last like less than a year. So like that makes me that does make me feel a bit better. <laughs> yeah, let's 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 like feel shitty together. Uh, I have for the last like probably ten years. At the end of sessions, I would always say like, "What's something you liked? What's something you didn't like?" And the responses were always garbage. Um, not because my players were garbage, but because you know it's not clear what what kind of feedback those are. Those are, those are narrow for. enough questions. Exactly. So I've actually started adopting not stars and wishes, but I've adopted a new um, feedback format, which I took from Asians Represent from their podcast and their actual play. Um, Agatha Cheng, who's doing their GMing, um, she does Roses, Wishes, and Thorns. Yeah, I, I love Roses and Thorns. Yeah. So I like that one because Roses already gives you like the idea that we're giving out roses, like we're throwing roses on stage. And I, like, I like that because we're performers, we're acting. Like yeah. At the end of the day, we are actors and we're performing and it's entertainment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I, I like that kind of Small imagery. Small crowd, but it's still acting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I like using that. I like to throw in thorns on top of the wishes and roses. Yeah. Um, or maybe, maybe I should go back and I should define what this is. Yeah, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. Uh, so I mean, I'm kind of I can guess from what you're describing, but yeah. Please. So I, I think it's important to to be explicit. So when I have my groups now, I tell them, okay, we're gonna do roses, wishes, and thorns. A rose is something you give to another player for something they did. You want to give a rose to Patrick because I thought you were really in that moment during that argument, and I appreciate that. I want to give a rose to the GM for letting me have that moment with the NPC. So you give a rose to a person. Uh, a thorn is something you give to an event or an action. So you can oh. thorn something like... But not a person. You can never give a thorn to a person. Oh, wonderful. And I make that very clear when I do that. I say, you can give a thorn to an action or an event, but you can never give it to a person. So a thorn might be, I don't like how we spent 15 minutes on the combat looking up rules. You can yeah. thorn that. That's an action that happened and everyone can agree. Yeah, that yeah. happened. If someone's fault, it happened, we're not gonna do it again. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we can thorn those things and by keeping it away from people, it actually really opens up people to give criticism. Yeah. Uh, you can also thorn events. Like, I don't like how we were having this moment and then we cut the scene in the middle of it to go to a different scene. I felt like we didn't close that loop correctly. And that I think is really meaningful to me as a GM or a DM. And then a wish, and you might do wishes differently. A wish for me is always something that you wish will happen the very next session. Oh, I, I like that. I wish we don't die is a common one. Uh, <laughs> I wish that my character gets to spend a little bit more time with this NPC friend, father, sister, yeah. whoever. I wish that we had that more moment. Um, my last session, I gave a wish and all my players stopped what they were doing and there was a like silence for like 15 seconds because I said to them, I wish you all as players would interact with each other more. Ooh, and my players stopped. Spicy. And they were like, we all wish that too. They're like, they gave up their own wishes and said, we wish we'd interact more. And then we had a conversation about how I can, as the GM, facilitate some of the, the scenes, mm -hmm. but they have to like act in them and they have to like invest in them. Otherwise it won't give the end result that we're looking for as a group. Well, yeah, is that what, is a big yeah. wish of mine as well with my group for sure. Yeah. Well, you probably saw like when I was in your game playing Zavon, like I always like to play 
the partner of another character or the family member of another character or a good friend of another character and I wanted to attach the Vaughn to someone to like give them like more one-on-one -on -one time and give them more funny moments. And I think you did a great job with that. With, yeah. Like, you know, you had that connection. You kind of liked um, Milos because you were just like, oh, he's friendly and like maybe friend. But then I got this like kind of jealous relationship yeah. with him that tied me to him that gave a lot of our good character moments. Yeah, I think, and I think that was kind of because you guys are like, you know, very good at the role playing and very experienced, you know, it comes through. Like I can tell like you guys know what you're doing when it comes to that. But it's also something even experienced players can struggle with because yeah. it's yeah. it's hard because you're kind of sometimes you're focused on this goal or interacting with this NPC and you forget like, oh, there are like four other people. And there's games that put it me. into the rules too. Like in Blades in the Dark, you're a gang together and it's like very upfront from the beginning. In Mouse Guard, you're a mouse patrol and you actually pick who's the tender paw, like the new recruit. Yeah. You pick who's the elder leader and who has like the, el the leader has the final say in everything kind of thing. You actually form a command structure. Um, there's all kinds of these games like Vampire the Masquerade gives you your clan and your relationship to other players. D&D does not give you, and when you make a character in D&D, you have no relation to their classes. It's not like Fate where you're, like Fate Core makes you kind of come up with a, a shared history with the other characters when you do character creation. There's so much opportunity um, and I mean, if you're giving us a weak ass rule like inspiration, but you're not giving us cool things to tie our characters together more than just met at a bar, I mean, that to me is a huge flaw of the system that I'm always trying to rectify. Like, I'm always giving my characters, like, even session zero, I might even t like make each one of them tell me a, an event in their history with every other character at the table that they fondly remember or hate. Like, you have to have a moment or a feeling or a bond with every character. But it's significant at least. Yeah, yeah like, and th these are things that could be baked in the rules, but. Yeah. Um, so I'll just chime in here. Yeah, uh, please. Shadzar says that maybe modern D&D doesn't, but AD&D uh, researched mm -hmm. something called The Caller. Uh, then there's also uh, the uh, the party quartermaster, et cetera. So like there are yeah. things that are involved that, you know, you can go back and re reference. I actually read a little bit about that and I do have to give a shout out to AD&D. They do have some awesome stuff that connects you a little bit more. Even if it's like a military, like kind of ranking connection or whatever you have, like all these kind of like, it can be a very like job like uh, kind of thing you're given, but like, yeah, they can really. Yeah. Cause sometimes that. it's hard to, and this is something I've, you know, I've, told many like groups of players I have, it's like, why are you guys together? Why are you together? Like, it's just like, you know, it's like, okay, well you kind of, it's kind of by happenstance, but then, but why do you stay together? Yeah, you need to, and like, I think it's definitely, like the DM can push, but it's on you as players to like form those bonds. Like, you Absolutely. know, it's on me as a player to make Zavon like Karen enough to at least have one good reason to stay in that party when she hates everything else about it. Exactly. And I think that is a perfect example of how you did it. It's just like, you know, Zavon is irritated by these characters, like foibles and how they act and stuff like that. But there's something about them that keeps her coming yeah. back. But that shines through and that makes it, that makes it, makes sense. That's why I like the story of her like discovering what friendship was because I was like, this gives her a reason to keep coming back because I, I knew I was in danger of not having that reason. Yeah, and because it's like, it's funny, but it's also like sweet and endearing. Like I love that character so much. Yeah, she's great. Can't wait for our beach vacation <laughs> Oh my God, right? Beach vacation scenes and tournament arcs are my favorite trope to throw in and just like break up the action. Are you up to date on our campaign? I'm like, I'm like two episodes behind. Oh, we I don't want to spoil anything, but like, the next time we start up again as a player group, we're going to like a vacation uh, spot and we're okay. going to adventure on a beach. All right. So I'm so excited. Kick me in the butt. Oh, <laughs> we're all like ready for our swimwear montage. Yeah. yeah. Especially, especially Milos, the centaur. <laughs> I okay. bring, bring back to hard modes though. I think yes. what we're talking about is fantastic because I think because we want the ups and downs, if your play, if your characters aren't bonded to each other in some way, you can never really get, down down which means you can never really get up up mm -hmm. um it's all that pacing it's all that up and down you gotta you gotta yeah. dive down to get to have that relief after and going back to like power by the apocalypse masks and their playbooks i think are great at that so oh. masks is a game where you play as young superheroes it likes like young justice it's young avengers game. um it's really really fun but your playbooks codify things like if you're going to be the bull who's like Superboy, who's like indestructible and like a rage hall and things like that um, you have to say someone at the table is your crush or you're in love with them. 
Mm-hmm. And someone at the table is also your rival, and you kind of want to like either impress or outdo them. And you can't play the game until you pick out who you're going to have a crush on. Yeah, Dungeon World, Apocalypse World, they do this so well. Like, yeah. You know, you play a wizard in, a, in Dungeon World, it's going to be like, who is woefully uh, naive about the world that you're going to guide? Yeah. And like... The cipher system has that too. Um, why? Yeah. Hey, Wizards of the Coast, why is every a single RPG coming out on the market, give me a way to connect characters, yeah. and you've had five editions and this much history. And Monty Cook, the creator of Cypher System, is, a, is you know, an alum mm. of d And here we are with a personality bond ideal and flaw. Anyways, I'll stop bitching about Wizards of the Coast because we'd love uh, D&D Beyond to sponsor oh, yeah. this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I mean, AD&D had it, so I mean, there's hope. AD&D did have it. I would love, I would actually, I mean, I'm going to say I'd love a Wizards of the Coast AD&D revival, but there's so many good revivals going on. Uh, I was going to say check out Wizard Thief Fighter. Um, They're doing some awesome stuff. They do psychedelic metal uh, inspired uh, AD&D shit. And like their art, they do all their own art for their work. I follow them on Patreon. They are fantastic. They have a great Discord to discuss AD&D with too. Um, like you're saying, there's just the OSR Discord. Mm. I love that this revival stuff is here. I'm gonna try and do my best with fifth edition. Obviously, I'm taking some inspiration from like stuff like Dark Sun and I don't know any homebrew I can grab my hands on to make it harder. But yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm pretty confident that you'll you'll turn it out. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm really excited to see how they fare. Um, I guess that like okay, yeah. So, sure, this has been a great conversation, guys. Um, <laughs> this has been fantastic. I want to just give a shout out. Um, it, did you know that if you hit the follow button on Twitch, you get a notification every time we go live with our amazing content. So that's probably something you should do. What? Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, seriously, I know everyone says like and subscribe, but for small creators like us, you don't know how much it means to us. If we get enough subscribers, it gives us a lot of benefits. So please chip in with us on the ground level here. It'd be awesome to get your support. Um, what's social media handles? Where can we find you? Uh, so I'll start off. Uh, so you can follow me on Twitter as D E E E M Steve. That's D M Steve spelled out phonetically. Um, I'm also that on Instagram. Uh, you can also catch me on YouTube. I'm the creator and editor of a YouTube series called Dungeons and Disasters, where we take three hour streams and I smash cut them to about 20 to 30 minutes long. So it's kind of like a TV series there. You can watch us kind of make mistakes and regret them later on. <laughs> um, so you can follow me on Twitter and on uh, Instagram at bloodphoenix89. And one day I'm going to say it and no one will laugh. And that day will be great. I didn't laugh. I just had to smile and close my eyes. I, 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 I laughed. I know. It's, it's, it's hard. But uh, anyways, you can follow me on there. Um, yeah. And besides that, you know, you probably see much more of me. And my buddies here on Can We Play Already? Yeah. Awesome. Um, I'm Julian. Uh, you can find my stuff on the DMs Guild by Julian Legault. You can find my character sheets I make on my website at uh, gamesandstuffbyjulian.com. Almost forgot my own website. <laughs> um, if you go to my website, you can find all my social. If you search Games by Julian on Twitter, you'll find me. Um, I'll give shout outs and updates about what we're doing with the stream. Um, and yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, our stream is going to start next Wednesday at 7 p.m. It's called Heroes of Volto's Crossing. It's going to feature four uh, misfit adventurers trying to survive in a harsh desert and save the world. And I can't wait to start it. Um, it'll be right here on the Can We Play Already Network, which is amazing. And you should uh, definitely join us for that. Yeah, we also uh, soon we're going to be I'm going to be DMing a uh, the game of D&D and it's based on Stranger Things. It's Woo! based on, like, takes inspiration from uh, the campaign that Mike creates in so uh, the show. That. Yeah, it's it looks really cute. Uh, I'm very excited for it. The notebook itself, like, the adventure book itself looks like an old school, like, notebook. It's very, it looks like a child made I it. saw it's your unboxing. Cute. It was so cool. It's fun. Um, yeah. Oh, also, for, forgot to mention, uh, follow us on Twitter as well at Can We Play Tweets. Yeah, mm. unrelated slash Ben will end it up. We're also going to have a game of uh, Kids on Bikes starting soon. Yes, very so exciting. So much stuff. We'll have content for Salt Marsh. We've got so much stuff in the works right now. Oh my God, we're just like <laughs> drowning in content. It's I almost know. as if you should follow us and then you'll get all of it. <laughs> well, thanks for tuning in to our, uh, to our deep dive into hard mode campaigns today. Um, yeah, we'll see you next time on Can We Play Already. Thanks for joining us. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.